So Keith's going to start us off. Just let me know when, Peter. Yeah, go ahead. We're gonna we're we're, we're gonna start on time. Okay. We still have people coming in, but that'll happen all throughout. Okay. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Kawaoka. I'm the Deputy Director for Environmental Health Administration, Department of Health. Welcome to the fifth meeting of the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee and the first virtual uh, meeting of the committee. Uh, we're going to do a round of introductions of the committee members. Uh, what I'll do is just start off with uh, groups or categories. So when I list uh, the group in, in, the, in the office, uh, you may be the person or you may be a representative of that, that office. So let's start with the uh, congressional delegation, uh, Senator uh, Schatz's office. Keith, this is Tu Perry from Department of Health. Um, I'm getting a text message from uh, Mr. Freeman saying that he's having a little of a problem signing on right now, so it might come in late. Okay. Uh, Senator Hirono's office. Hi, Keith. Carlos Santana here from Senator Maisie Hirono's office. Uh, Congressman Eight Cases office. Hi, uh, Jackie Conant. Sorry, I had to unmute. Jackie Conant from Congressman Case's office. Uh, Congresswoman Gabbard's office. Hi, this is Brandon Gray from Congresswoman Gabbard's office. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the state legislature. Uh, Senator Gabbard. Law, Chairman of the Agriculture Environment Committee. Lowen. Aloha, I'm here, Chair of the Energy and Environmental Protection Committee, and I have some slightly unstable internet, so I'm keeping my video off for today. Okay, roger that. Uh, Department of Defense, U.S. Navy. Afternoon, Keith. Uh, Brad Chadwick here with Captain Gordy Meyer. Keith, this is Disco Bennett from Pacific Fleet. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources. Uh, Kaleo Manuel, Deputy with the Commission Water Resource Management. Uh, Chair Case won't be joining us today. Uh, Ryan Imata, Groundwater Regulation Branch at the Water Commission. Water, water supply. Uh, Ernie Lau, uh, Honolulu Board of Water Supply. Uh, uh, Erwin, go ahead. Um, Erwin Kawata here. Thank you. And then we'll go to the public members, uh, Honolulu Valley Community Association. Hello, this is Melanie Lau. I'm representing the Honolulu Valley Community Association. Thank you. And our other public member, uh, Natanya. Hi, my name is Natanya Freetime. I'm uh, also on the committee, member of the public. Okay, and finally, last but not least, uh, US EPA Region 9. Hi, this is Steve Linder, EPA Region 9. Okay. Did I miss anybody or any other? Hi, this is Alejandro Diaz, the press officer for US EPA. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to review the duties of the, the committee uh, real briefly. Uh, you have the, uh, the purpose of the committee on page four of the agenda as presented in uh, HRS 342L-62. So I won't go over that specifically. Um, just briefly, and those who have been on the committee from the start, um, the FTAC has, has change both in committee and also in, in scope. Uh, both initially the Army and the Air Force uh, were on the committee, but they're no longer on the committee because they don't own any, or operate any field constructed tanks. So they're, they're not represented at the meetings anymore. Uh, 
uh, two members of the congressional delegation. While they are um, present in the meeting, um, they opted or elected uh, not to be uh, official members of the committee. Uh, that would be uh, Senator Schatz's office and uh, Representative Case's office. And then finally, um, Schofield Barracks, which is listed in the statute, but because there's no fuel constructed tanks at this location, this facility has been removed from further discussions. So uh, with that, uh, we uh, are trying something new this time. Uh, we will have a facilitator, moderator um, of this uh, committee. Um, there's a lot to go through today. So let me introduce Peter Adler, uh, who will uh, facilitate the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, aloha and welcome to everybody. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Peter Adler, and I am also being assisted by Megan Brotherton, who you might see there, and she and I are going to be co-hosting this, so we will be switching off. And you can, uh, Megan, you can make me the, the host for the moment because I'm going to put up some slides very shortly. And uh, you've all seen the agenda. Um, we're going to work our way through this. My goal and role here is to really try to have this be a productive and orderly meeting where people can uh, you know, make sure they learn things and say things. One of the things I learned from the previous meeting that wasn't there, there was a perception that there really wasn't enough time for both the committee to have discussion and that get questions answered as well as the public. So we're gonna to try to remedy that today. Um, let me just put up the slides. So I'm gonna put up, oh. Megan, you gotta make me the host, I think. All right. Okay, so let me, let's see, I want to do this, walk you through this. Um, so again, I'm here as a um, moderator and as a facilitator. Uh, my view is that this forum creates opportunities for the committee, the Navy, the regulators, and the members of the public to learn things and to have a chance to discuss things. But just so we're clear, the meeting is not about the operating permit or February forthcoming contested case hearing. Those are for uh, other forums and those issues are going to be discussed in those other forums. Um, I've, been, I've been retained by the Department of Health. Uh, to help manage this meeting. I promise you that I have no dog in the fight I will, or anybody's fight. And my job is I'm committed to staying very neutral, very independent on the substance, but very focused on making sure we have an orderly and productive meetings. Um, we know there's a lot of people going to be attending this. Uh, there's more checking in. So Megan is probably admitting people as we speak. I'm going to ask everybody to be very patient because um, this uh, working on Zoom and with this many people, it can be kind of messy and complicated and subject to glitches. So here's the rules of engagement. I would ask you to stay very focused on the issues being discussed and do not take the meeting off the rails or into another topic. I know there are many related topics and many issues, uh, but we're very focused on the issues that are uh, the subject of the committee. Um, we're gonna do this with a couple of presentations. First from uh, Stephen and EPA and from uh, Roxanne from DOH to talk a little bit about the AOC. A lot of people don't have the background on this. So that's the purpose of that. And there'll be some slides that, that follow. Um, I'm gonna ask the, that the committee, uh, you know, hold their questions until we've gone through the, that presentation plus the Navy's plus two Perry's presentation on uh, follow-up issues from the last meeting, which won't take long. The public discussion will start at 3.15 or sooner, and we will ask everybody to write their questions and comments and put those in the chat. And we are gonna be recording the chat line. We'll try to preserve the chat line. And two, Perry is monitoring that, and she's going to be feeding those over to me so that I can sequence things. We are gonna take questions for information first, always. 
and then comments. So we're going to bifurcate this and try and take it in two parts so that people who have a, a factual question, they want to know one thing, don't have to wait for uh, you know half hour to get a simple thing answered. And then we will open it up for lots of comments. So that's going to start at 3.15. The public part of that will happen at 3.15, but the same principle sits with the committee. Uh, I'll just say that civility is in the order of the day. And I know there are a lot of passions around the issues of Red Hill. And so I'm going to ask you not to interrupt, not to interrupt other people, and not to use this as a forum for long speeches. Uh, and I apologize in advance if I have to uh, defer things or cut you off prematurely. If I defer to later, I promise you I will try to come back to that. So here's the agenda, just to be clear. Keith's already started, and I'm just finishing it up. We're going to hear presentations from EPA and DOH. Uh, hear some uh, quick responses to carryover issues from last year's meeting. And then we'll get updates from the Admiral and Captain, Admiral Chadwick and Gordy Meyer, Captain Meyer. Uh, I'm not very good with titles, so I apologize in advance if I call you by something more informal. Then we'll have the committee member discussion, and then we'll have the public discussion. So I hope that uh, makes sense. And in a minute, we'll be coming back to that presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. But first, I just want to make sure that everybody's in concurrence and understands it. Are there any questions? Is everybody comfortable or clear about this? Um, Megan, uh, where are you? I'm, you know, we have now 88 people on here. Megan, you want to yes, say a little about Zoom protocols and just how we're going to manage the, this? Right. So, Everyone who does not have a participatory segment should keep themselves on mute. Um, that'll reduce background noise and interference. Um, the minor birds are going crazy in our yard, so I'm keeping myself on mute. <laughs> um, and if, um, if there is background noise that's causing a disruption, I may mute you. So be aware of that. It's not meant to be disrespectful. It's just to keep the meeting um, flowing without distraction. And you'll need to be sure to unmute when you have a, a section to participate in. And also during the public comment period, there is a three minute time limit on public comments later on in the meeting. So I will give a verbal notification at two and a half minutes. And then you'll be reminded at three minutes that your time is up. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out via chat. Um, but that you can chat to me privately if it's a non-subject non matter um, comment or question. Thank you. Now, if by any chance Zoom fails and the connection drops off, we will reboot it so you can come back on. It does happen from time to time. Zoom's not perfect. Hey, nothing's perfect. So um, we'll, well, we will do our best to make sure this meeting runs along. Okay. I'm going to go back to the share screen and uh, open it up for both EPA and DOH. Let me get that back on. Okay, so let me see here. Let's make sure I'm getting in the right place. All right. DOH and EPA, you are on. Okay. Peter, I'm not going to use any slides. So um, for my talk, you may want to, you know, turn off the screen share. Um, great. Um, so, uh, you know, some of you, probably most of you are familiar with, uh, um, you know, the, what's, what's occurred at Red Hill. There was a 2014 release of about 27,000 gallons of fuel. In response to that, um, EPA partnered with Department of Health and we negotiated an enforceable agreement with, with the DOD agencies, the Navy and DLA, to do a number of tasks uh, focused on uh, investigating improvements to the facility and investigating the subsurface in order to uh, essentially make some decisions on improvements to the facility uh, to protect groundwater. Okay, and go ahead. Get on. Okay, there, it's okay. on. Okay, bye. Hey, hey, hey. Sorry. Okay. Um, so 
that agreement was put in place back in 2015. And most of you have heard a lot about all the work that's happened under, under that agreement. Um, and, um, you know, so it's been a while since we've updated everybody on kind of the latest, you know, uh, happenings related to it. Um, as you probably recall, many of you probably know that the Navy submitted what's called a decision document for tank upgrade and release detection upgrade back in September of 2019. Um, the Navy held a public meeting at that time and explained their plan. Um, and then we talked about it back a year ago in the FTAC meeting. And then after that, the regulatory agencies held a public meeting to receive public comments on the, this decision document presented by the Navy. And uh, we received over 400 public comments on the proposal. And some of you may know, there's been some press coverage of it, but we earlier this week issued a letter in response to that proposed decision document and attached to that response letter is a um, consolidation of the comments and response to the comments we received. Um, so our response indicated that we're not approving the submittal. We identified numerous deficiencies in the proposal that need correction in order for the agencies to understand specifically what the Navy is proposing understand the basis for the proposal and provide the agency sufficient information justifying that the proposed decision is essentially the best available practicable approach at this time for upgrades and improvements to the facility. Um, so the response again includes both a list of these deficiencies along with this response to comments. Um, in addition to that letter, we also earlier this week um, issued a letter uh, in response to the Navy's proposed scope for further risk assessment work. Um, this letter follows several in-depth discussions between the regulatory agencies and the Navy and DLA regarding concerns with the proposal for next phase of risk assessment work. Although the first phase of risk assessment work provided some useful insights into the vulnerabilities and potential risk mitigation measures at the facility, uh, the way the risk was presented did not provide a clear nexus between potential failure modes and predicted environmental consequences and options for risk mitigation. Um, so we're now looking for the Navy and DLA to include a focus on environmental risk and options for risk mitigation in the next phase of risk assessment. Um, we are also still reviewing the groundwater flow model report and investigation and remediation, uh, re investigation and remediation of releases report. We received that back in March. Um, and, and just one second, I want to pause. All of these documents are available on EPA's Red Hill website. So it's epa.gov forward slash red dash hill, or you can Google it. And then there's a number of other documents also available on DOH's website. Um, so so it's, it is clear from the ongoing studies and data collection that there's a high degree of complexity in the subsurface at the facility, which makes the prediction of, uh, of flow rates and direction and potential contaminant movement very, very difficult, problematic. So that's something that we, you know, as we get further and further information, we're continuing to reinforce how complicated the subsurface is around Red Hill and how difficult it is to predict groundwater movement and contaminant movement. So we're currently working with Navy and DLA to determine what can be done to increase the reliability of the non-destructive testing as well. So that was another uh, study that was done and we responded to that. Um, it's basically to look for uh, corrosion uh, using a technology to look at the backside of the steel plates. So 
we received the report uh, from the Navy. We, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't agree with their conclusions, but we worked with them and we all agreed that there's opportunity for improvement. So the Navy is now moving forward with a scope to do additional work to look at improvement opportunities for that non-destructive testing of the interior of the tanks. Um, so um, in the future, we expect to see a revised tank upgrade and release detection decision document. Um, and since we just provided our response to the Navy and DLA, we can't provide an accurate prediction at this point in time of kind of the time frame for revised documents. Um, we are hoping that progress on some of the uh, ongoing studies related to risk assessment, corrosion, and groundwater can be used to better inform the revised decision document. So that's an update on AOC work status. Um, at this point, Peter, should, should I take any questions or are we gonna hold? Questions? No, we're gonna hold questions until we've gone through all the presentations, then the committee first, and then the public. So let's just work our way through all the, all the presentations. So Great. Uh, let, me go, let me go over to um, uh, Roxanne at DOH, and let me pull up your pictures. Okay, let me see, I gotta get down to the right one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Roxanne, go ahead, you're on. Okay, can you all hear me then? Am I coming up clear? Okay. Well, anyways, welcome uh, to the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, most of you have been attending this Fuel Tank Advisory meeting since we started back in 2016. I know there's many new faces and many new people that's, that just signed in. So I'm going to give you a background on roles and responsibility of what the different agency does. First of all, the Navy is the owner of the Red Hill facility. The Navy and the Defense Logistics Center, which is called DLA, they're both, they are both the operator of the facility and they are responsible for the design, operation, maintenance, monitoring, and release response action. The regulatory agency that is often heard of is consists of the Department of Health and the Environmental Protection Agency. We are the regulatory agency, we enforce the environmental laws and regulations, and we oversee the implementation of the administrative order consent, which is commonly everyone knows it as the AOC. Just recently in the past few, the past years, the state has conducted several site visits, no, no, conducted several site visits where we did a compliance inspection of the facility back in late September. Um, we also went to do a site visit at Red Hill while they were refueling the tanks. We looked over their records, the repair records, the refueling process and procedures, the automatic tank gauging records, the manual tank logs, and the tank tightness test that was done um, during the incremental fill. In addition to this, we also reviewed the soil vapor monitoring records and the quarterly groundwater monitoring records. Um, Peter, can you go to the next slide? Sure. Like, oh, one before. Thank you. Like Steve said, the administrative order consent, the AOC, was signed back in 2015 as a release of, as a response to the 2014 release at Red Hill. The main objective of the AOC is to ensure that groundwater source resources in the vicinity is protected and also to ensure that the facility is operated and maintained in an environmentally protective air manner. Uh, next slide. The scope of work that Steve mentioned the main, the, is designed to seek improvement for the design, operation, and maintenance, and monitoring. And currently, it is generally above and beyond what is currently required in the regulations. Uh, next one. The AOC also specified that the Red Hills tank be upgraded with an approved best available practical technology by September of 2037 
or it needs to be closed. Now, in addition to the AOC, the state also has regulations, and that requires that large fuel constructor tanks and airport hydrant system to have to be upgraded to secondary containment or utilize a design which the director seems determines to protect the human health and environment. And that deadline is July 15, 2039. I'm sorry, or, I'm sorry 2038 or be closed. Um, so that's all I have is regard to the roles and responsibility of the different agencies. Okay, good. Thank you so much. We're uh, it's it's very helpful. And again, we'll come back and pick up questions later for factual and informational clarifications and comments from the committee first. So, uh, to to Perry, this is now over to you for a quick conversation on carryover issues from the 2019 meeting. Tu, you're on. Okay, thanks, Peter. Good afternoon. My name is Tu Perry. I am the public participation coordinator for the. UST program for the Department of Health. Um, I want to uh, take some time to cover a few items, um, issues and questions pending from last year's meeting. The first pertains to one of the Navy's sites. Although the Navy always provides a status updates of each of their facilities, there were specific questions about Hickam PLL Annex uh, Kipapa that were still outstanding. So this is a bit out of sequence since they will be a, um, an official Navy presentation um, in a little bit but we wanted to highlight this question to ensure that it was addressed. For this facility, these questions did not get answered. Number one, historically, how much fuel was released? Number two, where are they in the decommissioning process? Number three, in, in 2019, there was a hit of methane in monitoring, and is this still an issue? Um, I wanted to hand it over to um, the Navy representative, Captain Gordy Meyer, who will provide the answer to these questions. Thank so you. I'm going to uh, bring on the Admiral first, if that's okay, and I'll put on the, the their slides. Oh, actually, sorry, Peter. This is just a short. Okay, response. go ahead. No, that's fine. My mistake. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Captain Gordy Meyer, and I'll address uh, the questions uh, that have been proposed. Uh, first uh, question is how much fuel was released at Kapapa? And so, as many of you know, the fuel storage annex operated from 1943. Uh, to 1993. And there are no historical records uh, that indicate uh, how much fuel may have been released prior to 1988 when the uh, Clean Water Act was signed into place. And from there, from 1988 forward, uh, you know, obviously everyone knows that any fuel releases greater than 25 gallons had to be reported. And we had no reportable incidences past 1988. And so, uh, we do not have the historical data on how much of fuel had been released when it comes to the amount that had been released. Uh, next question uh, was discussed uh, on, on methane. And yes, uh, methane is, continues to be detected at the site uh, you know, as uh, methane is a byproduct of the biodegradation uh, process of, of fuel. And so we do see uh, some elevated levels, but most of those levels are 10 feet underground or lower, and with our current land use, pose no uh, threat uh, to the public or any other uh, air people in the area. And then finally, uh, the question on uh, where we are in the, the remediation process. And so uh, I think some questions have come up on bioventing. And so uh, obviously we continue to monitor as the, the degradation, uh, biodegradation of the fuel occurs uh, at that site. Uh, we suspended uh, bioventing in 2017 as we were not seeing uh, the benefits of, of that uh, occurring. And so it was suspended and we continue to monitor it uh, on where it's at. And we plan to readdress uh, the potential need to, for bioventing to increase the biodegradation uh, next year. Uh, that's uh, an update uh, pending any additional questions. Okay, thank you, Captain Meyer. Um, okay, so for our next um, issue, so for those of, the, of you who attended last year's meeting at the state capitol, you may have remembered that it ended with a discussion of whether a provision of the state's Hawaii administrative rule would provide an automatic approval of the Navy's permit application. And if um, the DOH was able to review the permit within 180 days, it would have been automatic um, approval. So although the department at the time reassured the committee that there was no intention to 
give that automatic approval, DOH went ahead to remove that language through a formal rule of amending process. The omission of that 180 day statement was promulgated and became effective January 17th, 2020. This leads to the last issue, which is the actual permit application itself that the Navy submitted and was deemed complete on May 28th, 2019. Shortly after that submission, there was a request for a contested case hearing. This hearing was originally scheduled for November of this year and has since been delayed to February 2021. I mention it here as a carryover item, but the contested case is not a topic of discussion for the committee today. Um, the other carryover items were AOC updates, and I think uh, Steve Linder at EPA have covered that well. But back to you, Peter. Thank you. Here. Megan, you need to return the uh, posting over to me so I can share the. Oops, sorry about that. Wrong slideshow. Um, I'm having technical difficulties here. Huh. Okay, we're going to do this another way. There we go. All right, Navy, over to you. We've scheduled about a half hour for this, so please proceed. All right, well, good afternoon. Aloha to all. Uh, I wanna make sure uh, audio is coming through okay. Sounds good so far. All right, great. Uh, those of you who haven't met, uh, Rear Admiral Rob Chadwick, uh, Commander Navy Region Hawaii, and I certainly uh, uh, thank the committee for the opportunity uh, to address the group today. Uh, you know, I'll be speaking briefly and then turning it over to Captain Meyer for a more in-depth brief, but certainly one of the things I want to focus on, and it's already been talked about, is kind of the collaboration and partnership, uh, which, as we all know, uh, is the foundation of success of so many endeavors, and especially one as important as this. And I'm not just talking about the uh, formal uh, teamwork uh, that's associated with that, but uh, what I'm referring to is, you know, the community working together, uh, you know, tapping into the best and brightest minds uh, here in Hawaii, especially at the University of Hawaii, and I'll be talking about that. Uh, interest from community groups, people asking questions, and then everybody kind of moving forward in our, uh, you know, treasured uh, sense of aloha as we try to find uh, solutions together. And, uh, you know, obviously one of those partnerships that's already been highlighted, but I would also like to highlight is the uh, administrative order on consent. Um, or AOC, which, as you heard, involves the Navy, the Defense Logistics Agency, the Department of Health, and the Environmental Protection Agency. And what, among other things, that the AOC allows us to do with the regulators is have open and frank discussions as we seek to achieve our shared goals of protecting national security, of protecting the environment, and protecting our drinking water. And I can tell you that uh, the Department of Defense is investing significantly in the Red Hill facility to support all of those goals. And as you heard earlier, uh, earlier this week, um, uh, the Department of Health asked for amplifying inf uh, information on some of the recommendations in our over 100 page tank upgrade alternative decision document that was submitted last September. Uh, we're working with the regulators, uh, we're reviewing the feedback, and we'll work with them on an outline uh, on answering uh, their questions uh, moving forward. Um, but one of the things I will say is that we were obviously expecting feedback on that document. It's incredibly complex. Uh, so many issues were discussed in those 100 pages, and truthfully, feedback is part of the process. And I would argue that this is an indication that the AOC is working. Now, since the AOC was signed in 2015, the Department of Defense 
has invested and nearly $220 million uh, to the effort. And I can tell you that in the next five years, the Department of Defense is planning to spend nearly half a billion dollars on continually upgrading the facility uh, to make it even safer than it is now. And a few more comments uh, before I turn it over uh, to Captain Meyer. But uh, first, uh, Red Hill is a strategic necessity and it does provide uh, critical infrastructure uh, for our military, for our state, and for our nation. And I know many online are aware of this, but I think it's worth pointing out uh, that Red Hill does uh, serve as a strategic uh, you know, backup for the state of Hawaii. Uh, obviously, it's in a, uh, you know, a very uh, secure location, and the facility's elevated and underground location also makes it uh, very unique and uh, pretty much uh, uh, protects it from cyber attack and other attacks for that matter. Uh, but also its elevated position allows it to operate by gravity alone. And what we have shown is that because of that gravity fed capability, that we do have the ability to provide fuel to the international airport to the Port of Honolulu and the electric companies in the event of a widespread electric outage on the island, whether it be due to a natural disaster or some other contingency. And second, that Red Hill is safe and the drinking water is safe to drink. We test it regularly and the water quality reports confirm all of that. You know, as you've heard, uh, we have continually invested in the facility and that investment is going to continue. We are regulated and we work closely with the Department of Health and the Environmental Protection Agency who ensure that we operate the facility in a way that meets and in many cases it exceeds federal, state and industry standards and regulations. <laughs> And then finally, I'll get back to where I started, which is this partnership and collaboration. Again, it's, it's about the partnership and collaboration with the Department of Health and the EPA, uh, but I'm also incredibly excited about the partnership we've developed with the University of Hawaii. As when I talked about tapping into the best and brightest, and uh, certainly uh, that relationship has grown so much in the last year uh, as we uh, work with them and the wonderful folks at the Applied uh, Research Laboratory there as they help us as we continue to improve our operations and maintenance at the Red Hill facility. And uh, we look forward to that uh, relationship continuing to grow in the future. And then obviously an important piece of this is providing information uh, to the public. And obviously this forum is one avenue to do that. And I think I'm safe in saying that we all can, you know, uh, long for the days that we could do our uh, public meetings in person. Uh, in the meantime, we've been providing information with our uh, regular audio cast, and I commend those to everybody. Uh, but we are committed to that continual flow of information to the public. And you know, before I turn it over, I will say that as the Navy Region Commander here, it will always be a top priority for me. Uh, well, one of the top priorities will always be the safety and the well-being, as well as the access to clean drinking water for, the, for cur the current and future generations of Hawaii residents, as well as our military and their families, which include my wife and daughters, I might add. I assure you that everyone who has anything to do with the management, operation and maintenance of the Red Hill facility, they have the exact same priorities that I do. We are committed to protecting our nation and our environment. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to address the group today, and I'll be turning it over to Captain Meyer, who will be giving a more in-depth brief. And certainly before I turn it over to him, one thing I'll say is that I hope something that you glean from the brief is that uh, since we submitted the TUA document uh, over a year ago, uh, we certainly haven't been sitting on our hands and we've made a lot of progress in a lot of areas. And one of the more notable areas that we've made progress is uh, that uh, commitment to find a viable secondary containment option that we committed to in the document. And you'll hear, be hearing about that uh, more in his brief. So again, mahalo, 
and I'll turn it over to Captain Meyer. I'll cede my seat to him now. Thank you, Admiral. Aloha and good afternoon again. As previously outlined, I'll be providing an update on the field constructed uh, underground storage tanks uh, at the Hickam Annexes, Kuahua Peninsula, Pacific Missile Range Facility, and the Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage Facility. We truly do look forward to this discussion, which really underscores the close work with our regulators, as well as key stakeholders to identify the best solutions moving forward. And Peter, if I could ask you to move to the next slide. Thank you. And so uh, we will brief the committee on three categories of tanks. Really those tanks permanently out of use, uh, specifically the two Hickam fuel annexes, uh, the tanks at uh, Kuahua Peninsula that are temporarily out of use and pending decommissioning, and those tanks currently in use at Pacific Missile Range Facility in Kauai and the Red Hill storage tanks. Red Hill has 18 operational tanks currently in use or going through their clean, inspect, and repair process. The other two tanks, tanks one and 19, are temporarily out of use. Go to the next slide, please. I'll start with the, the Hickam fuel annexes. Uh, both annexes are currently out of use and there are no significant new updates since the last FTAC meeting. Uh, I did discuss uh, some of the items at Kapapa and the ongoing monitoring that continues under the guidance of our regulators there. Uh, next slide, please. At Kuahua Peninsula uh, and Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, the eight tanks totaling roughly 575,000 gallons are temporarily out of use pending decommissioning. Department of Health previously approved our actions to empty, clean, and secure the tanks. This effort is currently under contract and the tanks have been emptied and work continues to secure the tanks. Our future development plans for the area include eventually removing the tanks, although we have no specific timeline currently. Move to the next slide. At Pacific Missile Range Facility in Kauai, all tanks in use continue to pass monthly release detection. There are a total of nine tanks at PMRF. We are currently in the process of removing four tanks from service as they are not required at this time. The remaining five tanks totaling roughly 250,000 gallons were inspected in 2019 through 2020 and are in compliance with American Petroleum Institute standards and have current cathodic protection. All tanks are equipped with visual and audible alarms for spill detection and prevention. Next slide, please. The remaining slides will discuss the Red Hill Fuel Storage Facility. Can you hear me? As requested by the Department of Health, the following series of slides are structured uh, to address first items completed since the last FTAC meeting, ongoing actions, and finally targeted items planned to be completed before our next meeting. Next slide, please. We have a significant list of accomplishments since the last FTAC meeting in 2019. I will highlight a few of the items listed on the slide and have follow on slides providing additional details on the items in bold. All tanks in service passed annual tank tightness testing. The frequency of tank tightness testing increased annually in 2014 versus every other year prior to 2015. Are you on it? In 2019, the Navy subsequently increased tank tightness testing to every six month, months, twice as frequent as required by the regulators. The investigation remediation report and the groundwater flow model report have been submitted to the regulators in March of this past year and as outlined by, by Mr. Lindner uh, earlier. Also outlined by Mr. Lindner, the destructive testing results report was accepted in July of this year and the Navy is currently developing a work plan to address needs for potential survey evaluation. Hang on for one second, Captain. Can you hold it? Can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Yeah, I'd like to ask everybody to please mute themselves. We're getting some background noise and uh, we need to stay muted during these presentations. Thank you. Reading. Please. 
<laughs> Part of that work plan with the decision testing report will include development or implementation of best practices to control any potential corrosion. The Navy continues to pursue installation of additional monitoring wells to better understand the groundwater flow in the region of Red Hill. Three additional monitoring wells were installed since the last FTAC. To go to the next slide, I will outline our improved fill plan upon returning the Red Hill tank back into surface after the clean inspect and repair process. As part of our commitment to continually uh, process, to continual process improvement, an improved fill plan has been implemented. This new procedure gradually fills the tank in 10 increments grouped into four phases. Each fa at each phase, we conduct a tank tightness test. This new process was implemented in the filling of tank five with Department of Health on site at various times observing the process. This new process does take additional time and effort, but provides additional protection and control as part of the tank return to service process. The next slide, the test results of the tank five testing using this improved fill plan are outlined below. As you can see, Tank five passed all four of the tank tightness tests during the refill process and independently confirmed the integrity of tank five. This fill process is approved by the National Working Group of Leak Detection and Evaluation and part of our ongoing efforts to improve our processes and the security of our tanks. Next slide, please. We continue to move forward with our commitment to double wall the tanks at Red Hill as Admiral Chadwick outlined. We are very excited to announce our engagement with the commercial company to adapt their proven technology to support secondary containment. This is not a coating, but a proposed double wall stainless steel product with monitoring between the walls. In cooperation with the Defense Innovation Unit, we solicited industry for solutions to achieve our secondary containment commitment. A wide range of industry proposals were received from 16 companies. After a review of these 16 proposals, five were down selected for final consideration. A few of these proposals provided coding solutions. However, Captain, we Captain, selected the proposal Captain, that was the you. most promising. If you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanna ask everybody else to mute themselves. We're getting a little background noise and we will open it up for later for the committee and then the public for discussion. So please everybody stay muted. Thank you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no problem, this, I think this is a very important uh, topic. I wanna make sure everyone uh, can hear this. Uh, I'll, so I'll talk, uh, uh, make sure everyone can hear and repeat this a little bit on our work with the Defense Innovation Unit uh, to find a solution to our secondary containment commitment. Uh, going out and finding 16 uh, uh, industry proposals, down selecting to five and selecting a final proposal that truly would provide an actual double wall solution. This company that we've selected will be arriving on island this weekend to continue their feasibility study for adapting their product to the Red Hill tanks. The company, which is called Gauze Transport and Technogaz North America or GTTNA has a successful track record providing similar solutions to tanks even larger than Red Hill in the liquefied natural gas industry and is used in extremely harsh and dynamic conditions. This slide shows the various stages of our agreement with GTNA. We are currently in stage one with a feasibility assessment. We then plan to move forward next year with concept development. Upon successful completion of stage two, we would complete a prototype of an actual tank in 2024. Full production to the remaining tanks could then follow a successful prototype. We believe this effort is another example of Navy and DLA continuing to move forward on our commitment as demonstrated by our actions and financial investments. Move to the next slide, please. Since our last meeting, we're also excited to announce our partnership with the University of Hawaii addressing 11 different initiatives to innovate further improvements and innovation at the Red Hill facility. The Navy kicked off that partnership last December with the University of Hawaii in the Office of Naval Research. Navy has since awarded a sizable grant to the University of Hawaii to find solutions for each of these areas. We are excited to be able to partner with Dr. Brennan Morioka, 
Dean of the University of College, Dean of the University of Hawaii College of Engineering, and Dr. Margo Edwards, who heads the Applied Research Laboratory at UH. The partnership will allow us to leverage the best and brightest innovative minds in Hawaii. In the following slides, I will highlight a few of the initiatives that are bolded in this slide. Next slide, please. Flexible environmental sensing would provide continuous monitoring of our environmental sensors versus our current manual process, which is resource intensive and limits the frequency of sampling. This effort would result in quicker detection and reporting of environmental changes. The cybersecurity enclave and graphical user interface dashboard will help us better automate our data collection and storage and allow us to use it for better and easier real-time monitoring and reporting. The microbial degradation effort explores how fuel in the subsurface soil degrades for the development of sensors capable of continuous soil monitoring. The magnet wall crawling mobile robot would potentially provide the ability to remote or autonomous for a remote or autonomous robot crawling on the sides of the tank, even when the tanks are filled with fuel. This would allow for scanning of our tanks, not only during the clean inspect and repair process, but also when tanks are full for continuous monitoring. The University of Hawaii is also excited about the opportunity to be involved and be a part of the research and technology helping us move forward together. Next slide, please. I will now transition from what we have completed since the last FTAC to our ongoing work. This slide lists several of our continued and ongoing efforts. You can read them all in the slide and I'll highlight a few of the bolded items. We are currently in the process of our semi-annual tank tightness testing, which began on October 6th. We have successfully completed eight tanks, Two tanks are currently being tested and all tanks will be tested by the end of next month. We're also in the process of obtaining release detection equipment that will allow for continuous <coughs> on-demand testing, not just every six months. We are working on the installation of three new groundwater monitoring wells around the Red Hill facility and we continue our quarterly sampling and testing of the water along with monthly observation or detection of fuel on the surface of the water in the monitoring wells. All of our monitoring shows and demonstrates the water is safe to drink near Red Hill. This statement is further codified in writing with our annual water quality reporting, which I will describe in the next slide. As required by the Department of Health, in June of this year, the Navy released the latest water quality report for the Joint Base Pearl Harbor water system, which includes the Red Hill shaft. As expected, the water quality reports from both Navy and the Board of Water Supply continue to indicate the drinking water is safe and meets all federal and state standards. Next slide, please. Next, I will discuss items scheduled for completion prior to our next FTAC meeting. As you can see, another significant amount of work is expected to be completed. In the interest of time, I will highlight a few. Two statements of work are intended to be completed and approved early next year. First, the modified corrosion and metal fatigue practices statement of work. And as Mr. Linder also highlighted, phase two of our risk vulnerability assessment statement of work. The Navy will initiate a contract to install release detection equipment for on-demand testing. This of course is in addition to already installed tank level monitoring systems. Navy will initiate a pilot project to install continuous soil vapor monitoring equipment under the Red Hill tanks. Currently we take vapor monitoring samples monthly. We are hoping to achieve continuous real time vapor monitoring with this new equipment. Next slide, please. All of these efforts are part of Navy's multiple layers of protection to ensure the integrity of the Red Hill facility and the safety of our drinking water. The plan for further improvements laid out in the tank upgrade alternative decision document employs multiple and extensive layers of protection to prevent, detect, and lessen the release of any fuel. However, unlikely that may happen. Two major highlights of the Navy's commitment in the pursuit of technology I discussed earlier that can provide secondary containment and determine 
the feasibility for potential construction of a water treatment plant or equivalent monitoring controls. Our upgrade, our proposed tank upgrade alternative plan fulfills the requirement of the 2015 AOC to minimize the risk of future fuel releases and to ensure the Red Hill facility continues to operate in an environmentally protective manner. We, as discussed, we have received the letter from EPA and the Department of Health requesting additional amplifying information on our submission, and we will, of course, be happy to provide that. Next slide, please. An important part of our prevention is our clean, inspect, and repair process. We enhance this process with every tank as technology and the processes improve. This slide highlights some of our efforts to improve the process along with triple independent quality control procedures on all our tank repairs. Tanks 13, 14, 17, and 18 are currently undergoing the clean inspect and repair process. We expect to complete the clean and inspect repair process and return to service one tank per year. We will continue to take additional tanks out of service to undergo the clean and inspect repair process as each tank is returned to service. Next slide, please. Tank tightness testing is part of our release detection layers of protection. As previously outlined, the Red Hill tanks have always successfully passed tank tightness test testing, which we are conducting every six months. And as previously mentioned, we plan to install testing equipment that will allow for continuous on-demand tank tightness testing. Next slide, please. As part of our groundwater monitoring network, we have installed three additional groundwater monitoring wells since the last FTAC, bringing our total number to 16. And we plan to expand that further with an additional seven next year. Between now and the end of 2022, we plan on adding a total of 13 monitoring wells, bringing our total to 29. This network of monitoring wells around the Red Hill facility allows us to identify any issues and continue development of the groundwater flow model as we work closely with the regulators. Next slide, please. As has been discussed, our tank upgrade alternative and release detection decision document was submitted to the Department of Health and the EPA in September of last year. This week we received our first feedback from the regulators. The EPA, the EPA and Department of Health letter provided Navy and DLA the opportunity to respond to their 16 inquiries and resubmit. This response uh, was not unexpected for a document of this magnitude, as Admiral Chadwick has outlined. This is just part of the feedback process in the AOC as requesting additional information for clarity is not uncommon and desired. The regula regulator's response also highlighted several near-term projects in, the prog in progress and recommend to Navy and DLA to continue to move forward with these in support of the tank upgrade decision document. The Navy DLA team is currently reviewing the EPA and Department of Health letter and have already engaged with them to initiate discussions to clarify expectations and items in their letter. As required, in the next 30 days, we will officially respond to this letter. This slide shows the iterative process with feedback that helps us move forward in a synchronized manner with our regulators. We are committed to working together with our AOC partners. Next slide, please. Uh, we have briefly talked about the per permit, st permit status and I will not uh, dwell on this, but as you know, uh, the application for our permit was submitted in March of last year. The Department of Health considered the application complete and would allow Navy to continue to operate until such time as the contested case hearing, which is currently scheduled for February. Uh, to note also, the Department of Health just recently completed a full two-week compliance inspection in October on the Red Hill facility. No issues were noted, and we understand a full report from the Department of Health can be expected next month. Next slide, please. Our commitment to safeguard the water beneath Red Hill is also demonstrated by the large amount of money that we have spent and will it be expended in, in the future on the facility, also as Admiral Chadwick further previously outlined. We are more than committed to secondary containment. We are moving forward. 
Our partnership with the University of Hawaii and Applied Research Lab leveraged the talent of Hawaii's best and brightest to ensure the water remains protected. Because of our investments in all these efforts we are making, the water remains safe as reported annually in water quality reports from both the Navy and the Board of Water Supply. All tanks continue to pass tank tightness tests since they began in 2009, and the Red Hill tank has never failed a tank tightness test. The Navy is confident in the systems that are in place and those that will be implemented as part of the tank upgrade decision document, uh, whatever those final solutions are for the protection of public health. We just received the decision letter back from the regulators on Monday from our submission 13 months ago, and we're reviewing these requests now and we respond back to those requirements. I believe it's important to point out that the fuel stored at Red Hill is not only essential to US national security, it will also be vitally important to the residents of Oahu should a hurricane or other natural disaster knock out the power on the island. Next slide, please. As Admiral Chadwick had outlined, given unique location of Red Hills, elevated uh, location, it can provide fuel even without electricity in an emergency to critical, critical locations, including the Daniel K. Inoue International Airport, Hawaiian Electric Company, Honolulu Harbor, and first responder ships and aircraft. The facility was built on a hill for, for two reasons. One was to ensure it was protected from bombing during the war. But the second reason was also so that it could gravity, gravity feed fuel down to the harbor and airfields as you see here in this slide. So even if power goes out, the fuel can get to where it is needed, including, the, including to Hawaiian Electric Company power plants for supporting electrical generation and to the harbor and airport so that our lifelines to the mainland and elsewhere can be maintained. Next slide, please. You know, some argue that, that we must sacrifice security for health and environmental protection, but uh, we can do all three. We will work with our AOC partners on a tank upgrade alternative decision that will make this happen. We need only adopt the same can-do spirit as the people of Hawaii who built that engineering marvel that is Red Hill, which in turn helped the United States of America secure the peace in the Pacific. It is in that same spirit that we are partnering with the best and brightest here in Hawaii to ensure the continued protection of our nation and this state, the beautiful environment and our clean drinking water. The release in 2014 was a result of human error, not corrosion or degradation of the Red Hill infrastructure. The Navy has since put additional layers of protection and enhanced processes in place to ensure that such a mistake does not reoccur. In closing, I would like to state that the Navy is serious about moving forward on improvements, our projects and innovation initiatives that I have described. And we remain fully committed to the AOC, the state of Hawaii, to the people of Hawaii, and to the protection of Hawaii's natural resources. Mahalo. Well, thank you very much. Captain, and uh, I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to stop the share screen. I'm going to turn the hosting over to my colleague, Megan, and uh, then we'll pick it up with the, the committee. And I'll say a couple words in just a moment about that. So Megan, I need to find you. We now have oh, 97 people in here. There you are. And, and make, there you go. Megan, you're now the host. Okay, let me, a number of people have come in late, so let me reiterate our procedures here just so we don't get confused later on. <clears throat> We're midway through our meeting. We're actually making good time, so that will leave more time for questions and comments. Uh, we're, the next segment is really going to be over to the Fuel Tank Advisory Committee and only them. So this is not the moment for public discussion. And with the uh, committee, the idea is to take uh, questions for clarification and information first. For example, you might say, what is a microbial, uh, you know, uh, system for cleaning the soil? It was mentioned by the captain. What, what is that? That's a, that's a factual clarification piece. So it's not the time for a comment. We'll do those first, and then we will take comments from the committee. 
then we'll stop. We'll break for a, a, a minute, and then we'll open up for the public, and we'll use the same procedure. So if I can ask everybody else who's not on the committee to please stay muted. Uh, and if you don't mind, you can turn off your videos if you wish. That will preserve a little bandwidth as well. So thank you. So the floor is open first for clarifications. And by the way, anybody, public or committee members, but especially the public, you can send questions or comments into the chat system. And to Perry from the Department of Health will feed those over to me on a different line. And I'll be trying to use those to call on people later. So the floor is open. Committee members. And you're all, most of you are on mute, so you may need to unmute yourself when you want to either ask a question or when we get to a comment. So the committee uh, members, um, does anybody have any questions or comments on the presentations that were made up to now? Uh, if you can't, you can raise your hand or raise your virtual hand. Those of you who know how to do that. Anybody? Dr. Lau? Hi, um, is my, my mic is on, right? Yes. Uh, I have two questions for the Navy. Um, probably in 2017, the tank upgrade alternatives included relocating the tanks so that they are not over the aquifer. For the past two years, there has been no mention of these plans um, and you're spending a lot of money and energy trying to find an alternative to just double walling the tanks. Um, the secondary containment idea sounds great, but it's also still in its infancy. And if you look at the timeline, your first tank test is going to be in 2024. The AOC runs out in 2037. If it's going to take you that long to do it, and if it fails, how do you know it's going to um, meet the AOC's requirement by 2037? So relocating the tanks, I'm not talking about literally digging them out of the hill, but it's just making double walled tanks that are visually inspectable, which was on your previous report, something you said was the best um, available practicable te technology at the time has somehow gone away from consideration. The second question I have is in the 2018 meeting, one of your Navy members said a fuel needs assessment was going to be made because maybe we don't even need all the fuel here at the Red Hill tanks. And I haven't heard anything about that either. And you did not address it in 2019 or now. So those two questions I have for you right now. Good, back to you there, uh, Captain Meyer. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the first question on relocation. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, the, there may have been discussions on, on the ability to relocate uh, the Red Hill facility. However, that is not easily done and we've not found a solution that meets our needs of the capacity that Red Hill provides as well as the protection it provides. Um, yes, we are spending a lot of money because that shows our commitment, but unfortunately relocating the requirement is even uh, significantly more costly and not something that uh, we see as being feasible within uh, real realistic uh, uh, constraints. Uh, second question is on the fuel needs assessment. And yes, uh, uh, Pacific Command, Indo, Indo Pacific Command has done a, a complete, just recently completed a fuel study and uh, that classified document is, uh, is being uh, staffed and uh, it, it doesn't specifically address Red Hill, it addresses the fuel, across, fuel needs across the Indo-PACOM area, not necessarily the specific items at Red Hill. And so right now we have no indications that the requirement for Red Hill is going to diminish. Let's do other questions for information or clarification. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Others? We'll come back for comments. We, we're not gonna skip over that, but I wanna get the informational pieces out first. Others? Um, I had a question. I guess this is just a clarification, so I understand correctly. There's been two hundred and twenty million dollars, you know, spent upgrading the facility since twenty fourteen. I'm not sure if that's accurate. Um, but I just, you know, there was a lot of um, information about what you folks are doing. Um, you know, what upgrading the facility specifically means, monitoring, testing. 
the improved fill plan. Um, and I'm wondering if kind of like that, you know, there's testing and there's monitoring and like making sure you're filling up the tank um, in a particular kind of way. But in terms of upgrades to the physical tanks, do you think you could give more detail about, uh, you know, what, what sort of upgrades you have been doing? And then second question, um, on one of the slides, there was modified corrosion and metal fatigue. Um, I didn't write the whole thing down, but I was just wondering if you could explain what that means. Uh, yes. And so uh, the, the first item uh, addressing uh, upgrades. So what are we doing to upgrade uh, the tanks, uh, I believe correctly. And so that is specifically in our clean and inspect repair process. Uh, you know, we periodically we, we clean and inspect and repair each tank to ensure its integrity and it maintains uh, its ability to, to retain the fuel. And so the upgrades that we are really doing are in, is in that process to inspect the see where there could be a potential failure years in advance uh, in catching that now and doing that those repairs uh, by specifically, uh, and I say specific repairs, uh, uh, comparing them with the similar type of steel uh, plate and securing that appropriately with the triple layer protection uh, of the quality control to ensure that is, is done correctly. And so uh, that is the, the upgrades to the tank. Our processes continue to upgrade as well. And some other upgrades we have done is, uh, is uh, not to get, try to get too technical, but when you look at the tanks, at the bottom of the tank where the fuel comes out, it's called the nozzle. And so what we have done is uh, decommissioned some nozzles that are not easily maintained. And so this allows good inspection of the nozzle that could be uh, a potential point of, uh, of concern. And so what we've done is made sure we can maintain those and provide the integrity of the tanks through, through those areas. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, we talk about the tanks, but our entire, it's part of a system and the, and the lines that go all the way from the fuel tanks down to uh, the port and our airfield and ensuring that uh, those processes and those uh, items remain in the best possible uh, condition to ensure their, their continued safety. Good. Other questions for information clarification from the committee? Yes. Uh, Peter? Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. This is our, oh, I'm sorry, uh, who are you? Hands. Go ahead, Ernie, and then we'll come back to Mike. Okay, sorry, Mike. Uh, uh, Ernie Lau, Port of Water Supply. Uh, question uh, about this pilot that they're doing. Um, uh, since the EPA and Department of Health uh, basically rejected the uh, clean and spec and patch approach, which is currently what you, uh, Captain Myers, you just described, uh, is the intent on the re, re, uh, resubmittal of the tank upgrade alternative uh, decision document uh, to submit based on a doubled wall tank, a tank within a tank with a stainless steel inner tank shell. Yes. Can so, I clarify uh, real quick our, our letter? So Ernie, our letter um, basically did not approve the plan because it was inadequate. It didn't have the detail we were looking for. It didn't have the rationale, but we didn't reject any particular option. So everything in our mind is still, you know, open for consideration. Uh, so just to clarify, Steve, thank you. Uh, and uh, the range of six options, which didn't include relocation in the uh, TUA decision document, uh, the clean inspect and patch, which was their recommendation, the Navy can actually resubmit on that recommendation with a little bit more information and it might get approval of the Department of Health and EPA. Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, so uh, maybe a question for Captain Myers and how does the, um, and, I, and I appreciate uh, them considering to do an actual pilot of a doubled wall tank. Uh, and, and just to clarify it, what they're proposing with GTT and A, is that a true doubled wall tank, a tank within a tank with a interstitial space that can be inspected and repaired. Yes, thank you. And so the, the proposed uh, solution with GTTNA, as we uh, understand it right now, again, they were in the feasibility stage, 
would truly be, uh, I don't want to necessarily use the word tank within a tank, but it is a complete doubled walled with a monitored interstitial. Uh, now, that monitored interstitial, how wide do you think it'll be? Um, I would hate to project uh, at this point uh, as the, the company is uh, developing uh, their solution and adapting it to our facility. Uh, I, I would, would hate to say right now. Uh, so it could be as little as a, an inch for if you put sensors in there or it could be feet, feet wide, uh, multiple feet wide. Uh, whatever the, the, uh, the depth or the, the size of that interstitial will obviously, we would want to be monitored and I would expect it to be monitored, yes. Uh, maybe just a, clar just a clarification, I'm just, I'm sorry. Uh, on your, the interstitial space, which is a space between the inner tank and the outer tank wall, the existing wall, uh, you're saying it's for monitoring. Is it there also so it can be repaired from within that space to repair the inner tank from the outside? Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks. So let me clarify uh, when we talk about the current solution. Uh, you could almost argue that that what is being proposed, I can't say this will be the final solution that is, is uh, developed, is actually almost a triple protection. It would be uh, a stainless steel liner, an interstitial space, another stainless steel liner, and then our current outer tank wall. And so uh, that interstitial would be between two new stainless steel walls within the facility. And uh, uh, Captain, with uh, room for whatever instruments you use to go in between there. Right, Wh whatever is uh, the, the final solution for, for monitoring, ensuring that that most inner tank wall is tight and does not create any releases outside of that inner tank. Thank you. Uh, but just to come back to my point, I'm sorry to be a stickler. Will there be enough space to allow that inner tank wall, the new stainless steel, supposedly stainless steel tank or liner to be repaired from the outside should it corrode? Because, you know, we use stainless steel too and we've seen it corrode also. Um, I can't say that it will have that ability at this time. Uh, as we develop the, the feasibility uh, assessment uh, this year, uh, we'll be able to answer that, answer that further. Oh, okay, so it's not in your scope at this time for GTTNA to look at also maintenance uh, as a criteria? Obviously, maintenance is a criteria that we want them to look at, uh, but that specific criteria has not been finalized on uh, potential uh, exterior repair. So not, uh, oh, I see. So not in your current scope uh, for GTT. It's, I would say it's not in the scope. It's not out of the scope either. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. My recommendation, please put it in the scope. Thank me, you. Thank you, Ernie. Let me go over to Senator Gabbard. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Captain Meyer, uh, related to what uh, was just being spoken about, you'd mentioned that GTT and A uh, the, that prototype is going to be done by 2024. What does that mean in terms of a projected timeline for all the tanks at Red Hill? Yeah, that, uh, great question. And so, uh, again, I like to stress that we are in the very early stages of this feasibility assessment. And um, I would hate to project now and extrapolate the ability to complete and how long it would take to complete the remainder of the tanks, assuming that we have a good prototype that is completed in 2024. Obviously there will be some economies of scale that could be involved to improve the timeline uh, and how long it would take to implement the solution. But uh, I would hate to project at this time and as we gather more information this year, we can probably better answer that question. Okay, my second question, uh, Captain Myers. No, I was glad to hear uh, Admiral Chadwick committing uh, to provide information to the public and you know, whether it's Red Hill fuel tanks or the, the Westlock munitions annex project, there, there seems to be a disconnect regarding public input and an open, uh, honest dialogue related to Navy projects that have very real health and safety uh, impacts on our residents and our environment. So, and I know you're new to your position, but in my humble opinion, there's definitely some work that needs to be done in this area. And my question is, how do we heal this growing divide between the community and the Navy 
and work towards solutions that both our state and the Navy can live with. Yes, but thank you, sir. And uh, yes, we are, are committed to, to open and transparency uh, as Admiral Chadwick outlined. And so how can we, we better do that? Um, obviously this is one forum. Um, we can look at ways to continue to increase our, our, our dialogue as best as possible. Uh, but we, we were, uh, we're committed to working together to find ways to make that happen. And we are open to ideas of how to help do that as well. Thank you, Captain Mark. Okay, other questions? And I know this bleeds over into comments. Uh, Mike, that was a good example of a comment and a question, which is fine. Are there comments or questions at this point? If there are questions for clarification, let's grab those first. And otherwise, the uh, floor is open for comments. Yes, Dr. Lau. I, I have a question on the interstitium. I know you can't commit and you can't expect the contractor to give you a firm, but are we talking like inches or feet where they're going to put the monitoring in the interstitium? Hey, uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, again, I'll, I'll restate that we're in very early stages. Uh, the contractor is arriving this weekend uh, to do further studies. And so I, I can't commit if it's going to be inches or feet at this time. Can I just ask a question on behalf of the committee and probably the public would want to know as well. What, as you go through your feasibility study, the results of that come back to the AOC? Is that what the plan is? How do those uh, unfold? Absolutely. As, as we continue to learn more and we gather additional data from our feasibility study, we will, of course, uh, uh, share that and uh, not only with this forum, but also with the AOC. Okay, other questions, comments from the committee? And I thank uh, everybody for their great cooperation on this. Uh, Peter, uh, this is Ernie, a question. Go ahead, Ernie. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Captain Myers, uh, just to, to understand uh, what tanks have not yet been inspected under the API tank inspection protocol that you currently do. So can you identify which of the 20 tanks have not uh, gone through that inspection and repair process according to your, your API process. Thanks. Uh, as, as you know, we, we are committed to that, that uh, clean inspect and repair process. The exact tank numbers, uh, whether uh, I, I don't have that information right in front of me, but happy to get back to you so that we share that information uh, on where we're at with those tanks. Oh, that's great. And uh, maybe it'd be good to share with the committee if I could suggest, but uh, could also, uh, can we, uh, can the committee uh, get co uh, complete copies of all the tank inspection reports uh, for our information and review? Yes, I think as, as with all of our uh, tank tightness inspections, uh, we are happy to share our, our successful results and all of our results uh, with, with you in the committee. I, I know you, uh, if I understand the process, it, it's filed with the Department of Health, is that correct? Yeah, so as we share with, with our regulators, which is our requirement, um, you know, we, uh, we, we do that on a re reoccurring and regular basis as required by the regulators. And uh, I guess I'll say it's a collective process between us and the regulators to ensure that is uh, properly disseminated. Uh, so I really, would really appreciate it, uh, Captain and also Admiral, if you could authorize the regulators of Department of Health uh, is the primary uh, UST program regulator in Hawaii uh, to release those documents to the public. This is, this is Roxanne from Department of Health. We don't have the reports of the tank tightness test reports. Uh, no, uh, the tank inspection reports. Do you have them all, Roxanne? No, we don't have we don't, them all. We don't, we, don't keep maintain, the physical. we don't maintain these reports. Oh, why, why don't you keep them? We all, sure, well, these are we reviewed when we can go, go out and conduct inspections. We don't uh, require to be submitted to our office. Oh, oh okay. And then going back to Captain Myers, uh, because I understand you know, I've seen partials of these tank inspection reports. Uh, they indicate what was found uh, in the inspection, you know, dense, through hole corrosion, that kind of stuff. Uh, you, uh, could I request uh, as a committee member of the FTAC uh, that the copies of all the reports that have been completed, uh, tanks have been completed, be released to the committee and 
uh, be made of, to available to the public. Sir, we'll be happy to work with our regulators on uh, on releasing any any appropriate documents uh, that uh, are pertinent and and of interest uh, that are uh, so that the regulators and we concur with absolutely. Yeah, in particular, I'm really interested in those tank inspection reports. Thank you. So those could also be items that may come before future gatherings of this committee and the public that listens in. That's something to be thought through how that is. Ernie's basically saying, how do I get the reports? I want to get them. The public wants to see them. Board of Water Supply wants to see them. So that's something that uh, to be worked on and maybe they come before this committee, which is not the same as the AOC, is that so everybody understands. Other questions, other comments from the committee? This is Captain Meyer. I apologize if, if a couple of early questions were multiple questions that I might not have answered completely. I'm, I'm ready to help uh, re readdress those as needed. I'm going to make it a rule not to allow compound questions all at one time, as they say. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's my fault. So other, are, are, did anybody not who asked multiple? Melanie, I think you asked a question. Natanya, you might have asked a couple of questions. Did you get answers to what you asked? Uh, this is Melanie. Um, a little, but I was waiting for the comment se section because I guess I. Anyway, I, I guess I'll wait for the comment part because okay. I do have it's some comments on the in, question. Coming up very shortly. Natanya, did you get answers to the questions you asked? Yes, I'm still a little unclear on what modified corrosion and metal fatigue. That was just a line in the PowerPoint, and um, I wasn't really sure what that meant. You want to clarify that, Captain? Yes, that's also a part of an issue that University of Hawaii is working with. Um, obviously, we have uh, metal uh, that are in our tanks, and uh, and there's the potential for metal to uh, to have some uh, uh, corrosion. And so we were doing make sure that our tanks remain secure and safe is looking at what are the best processes that would study any potential corrosion that may happen. And so that's also part of, like I said, part of our initiative with the University of Hawaii. I'm gonna open it up to comments and then go back to Melanie first right away. So the floor is open. I ask you to keep it down to not more than 45 minutes in your comments. Sounds good. <laughs> I, do, I do have one question I forgot to ask is, why do we only have one AOC meeting? I mean, uh, one FTAC meeting a year. Why can't we have two so that we can address our questions more in real time? Because um, it would have been nice to have known about this, you know, stainless steel tank idea before. Um, and you know, it was, yeah, the comment I have is the fuel tank, uh, so fuel assessment needs. It seems your little um, presentation on the Kauai facility, all of a sudden four out of the 10 tanks, if I remember correctly, are no longer needed. So to me, that means four out of the 10, the fuel has decreased by about 50%. So in the Indo-Pacific theater, maybe the fuels have also decreased 50%. But we don't, we're not privy to that detail because everything is just always blotted out or it's because of national security. So to like Senator Gabbard's comment, to make the public feel more safe or like we're part of the discussion, it would be nice if you would kind of let us know about those things as well. I mean, without having to commit to saying we need this many gallons per year. Let me, let me uh, take the first part of your question and go over to Keith or to one of your colleagues at Department of Health on future, future meetings, excuse me. And I can't remember if this is only once a year or are there multiple uh, sessions being planned for the future. Keith, any comment? Yeah, you know, right now um, we've been doing once a year. Um, we've talked about, and maybe we can table it. There is an item to specifically think about that aspect of the frequency. So we're going to suggest several options um, for the committee and we can discuss at that time. But th that's a question that's been coming up uh, several so we'll, times through the year. So we'll discuss that item. It, it's but, on the agenda. Okay, thank you, Keith. And now back to Captain Myers, you know, on the, the, the actual fuel needs in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, which Melanie was asking about. Uh, yeah, so I, I specifically addressed the, the, the specific needs in Kauai when I talked about not currently needing that. Uh, I don't think we can extrapolate that to, to the larger needs of, of indo pacom uh, region. Okay, are there other questions or comments? And I think from what I understand from what Melanie was asking that some of this is 
uh, blacked out and it's uh, secure information. It's part of, you know, it's not, not public information. It's part of the security apparatus. That's how I interpreted what part of what she was saying. Other comments, other questions from the committee? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Senator Gabbard. Yes, uh, Peter, this question's for uh, DOH and EPA as the regulators. Uh, in your, Stephen, in your October 26th letter to the Navy, uh, you wrote that their tank upgrade recommendation, quote, lacks detail, clarity, rationale, and justification, unquote. So my question is, what do you see as the best option going forward for the Red Hill fuel tanks? That's a question to EPA and to DOH? Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, let, me, let me start and I'll let DOH uh, uh, weigh in. Um, you know, I think there's potentially multiple approaches. Really, the devil's in the details in terms of all the various different uh, actions they should be taking. Um, you know, the goal is to essentially prevent all releases. So, you know, it's a, a, a variety of things to prevent releases. It's the maintenance or improvements, better NDE is one approach. So that's, I'd say, the first kind of layer of protection is prevention. The second is, you know, rapid detection and response. So if something does go wrong, then they need to be able to detect quickly and be able to respond quickly to a release in order to minimize any kind of impact from the release. And then kind of as a final layer of protection, they need to have a plan for if something more catastrophic does occur. You know, we think from all the work that we've done so far, we think a catastrophic problem is quite remote it's more likely to occur not in the tank vessel itself, but probably in the lower tunnel area where there's piping and the nozzle infrastructure. But the Navy needs a plan also for that, for a contingency plan to address kind of these, you know, have a plan for if something really big did happen. You know, what is the plan? So it, it's a combination of things. And, um, you know, I don't think we're ready to say right now what the right answer is, because a lot of it, comes down to feasibility to build it and build it quickly. Because if, it, if it's something that takes a long time to build and you've got the current infrastructure that's potentially got more risk right now, you may actually have, you know, if it takes too long to build it, you're not really accomplishing what we're trying to do, which is reduce risk as quickly as possible. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's complex. We've got a number of experts working uh, on our team to advise us on kind of what the right approach uh, will be. And, you know, and so we're looking for, you know, a more detail from the Navy, uh, clear information, and a really clear nexus between the actions and protection of the environment. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Senator. Thank you, uh, Steve, other questions, comments? The floor is open for comments. I'm not trying to stop your comments. Just wanted to take it in sequence. Any more? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Law. Sorry. Um, okay, that's what this is for. Okay, so the other question I had was the term, the BAPT, Best Available Practicable Technology. That's what the AOC deems should be done as of being signed in 2015. So I had to actually look up what practicable meant and practical meant feasible and able to be put into practice. Part of what the AOC says is that you will be doing what's practicable as we're going along. And so what is practicable right now is above ground tank technology, granted not at the size that is underground right now. Um, so again, why not implement one or two or five tanks at a time when you do get the secondary stainless steel container thing worked out, then you don't have to decommission the rest of them, but you've already mitigated the risk to the water and the people of Hawaii um, by finding other practicable solutions now, putting them in place now. So, so there's two questions in there. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> no, that's okay. I'll scold everybody on that. 
So the first one, what does practicable mean? What, is, what does that mean? And then second of all, can there be, there be a transition, if I understood your question, Melanie, can there be a trans transition from some of the tanks to another location or another, uh, you know, top above ground? Operation? What does practicable mean? Captain, can you answer that? At least for the Navy's view? Sure, uh, from practical uh, practicability, uh, we would uh, agree with Dr. Lau on that definition of what, what she provided. Um, you know, there's a variety of factors that go into applicability, um, including, uh, you know, resourcing that is required and, uh, and what's available, what can be done uh, reasonably and, and in a rapid fashion. So no, no uh, uh, conflicts with the definition that was provided there. Uh, and, this is Steve, and, that, that term is very common in environmental regulations requiring technology, so for water treatment or for air treatment. It's a pretty, it's a very common term used to kind of define what is the kind of that right approach for technology. It's not, you know, the, you know, it's something that's kind of implementable. It's not something that's experimental and, you know, extremely costly and uncertain. It's something that technology that, um, is uh, easily put into practice. Um, but there is some subjective, you know, uh, interpretation of what that means. And that's typical for all environmental regulations when technologies are being chosen. Um, Captain Myers, can I ask you to go back to Mel the second part of Melanie's comment or question, if I understood it, which was, can you begin to transition some to uh, from underground to overground? If I heard it right, Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Yeah, so we'll obviously work with our regulators on, on the best available practical uh, solutions. Um, obviously, there is a lot of uh, factors involved in above versus above ground uh, that uh, including the security of the tanks. And so uh, that will be part of our, our discussions with the regulators on what is uh, potentially feasible of above versus below ground. I think they were able to find a practicable solution at Point Loma, which was above ground. And also, I can't remember the name of the base. I think it's Kitsap in Washington. Again, granted, it is not the same size as here, but you could scale it so that the most vulnerable areas of the aquifer can be protected now and not wait till 2037 when the clock runs out. Yeah, absolutely. We, we are aware of uh, what uh, uh, was done on the West Coast with some of the tanks there. I don't believe that is a, a, a fair or apples to apples comparison on how we could uh, move forward here, but we will continue to work with our the regulators here to ensure uh, we've got the best available practical uh, solutions uh, to ensure uh, both the needs of uh, national defense as well as the protection of our resources. I have a feeling we will in the future be returning to this question of practicable. What is practicable, which certainly involves, you know, some deficiencies and viabilities and cost issues, resource. It's got to be a combination of things. And probably Steve Linder can have, talk much more about that at some point. Other comments, other questions from the committee? I'm going to, at the right moment, transition to the public. Just to add what Steve had uh, about uh, BAPT or Best Available Practical Technology, uh, the clock has started. And when we signed the AOC, it had an endpoint um, in the AOC. And the reason why we've kind of grouped the 18 to 20 tanks in, in, in manageable bite-sized chunks, if you call it that, uh, was main, to maintain the Navy's readiness to be operational at any one time. So at any one time, we'll take about four or five tanks and look at what technologies are available during that period of time for BAT. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, we're still going to the first BAT, but the clock has started. If we don't have, if the Navy doesn't satisfy us with a, a technologically and feasible technology, and we don't grant BAT, they cannot return those tanks back into service. So as time goes on, if uh, BAP isn't granted by 2037, the those tanks that have not been granted BAP cannot be returned to service. 
Thanks, Keith. That's a very good clarification for the public, especially for those who are new to the issues. Other comments, other questions? Committee. Is there, a, um, is there a timeline for the Navy to address the uh, concerns that EPA and DOH raised in the 26 uh, October letter? Um, I can respond to that. So the way the AOC was written, they have a 30 days to either resubmit the document or get back to us and, and have a, a meeting to discuss kind of a timeline. So at this point, given the nature of our comments, they're fairly extensive. We don't expect to see a revised document in 30 days. So, but we do expect to have a meeting with the Navy probably within you know, 30 days of our letter to discuss kind of path forward and a schedule. Um, and as Keith mentioned, the ultimate draw, uh, deadline to have all tanks upgraded still remains. So the Navy should be motivated to move quickly. Good. Any other questions? Any other comments? I have a comment it, related. Natanya, oh, go, go ahead, ahead. Natanya. Go ahead. Okay. So this isn't really about the kind of technicalities of the, you know, the fuel tank. It's more about the um, PR collaboration and partnership with the community. Um, and, you know, I'm new to the, the committee, but um, I was at a Pearl City Neighborhood Board meeting back in 2018, and I was kind of uh, taken aback by the behavior of a Navy representative, uh, Victor Flint, who was responding to, I mean, he gave his presentation at the community meeting um, and was asked a question by a neighborhood board member. Um, and his response was pretty heavy handed uh, and almost kind of in a scolding manner. Uh, she had questioned um, what the Navy had done since 2014. And it was 2018. I haven't been back to the neighborhood board since then. So I don't know if this is kind of uh, typical of this particular Navy official, but he had um, kind of responded to her by saying, like, that's wrong. Aole. And it was a clear indication that the question was unwelcome. Um, that's at least how I interpreted it and sort of shut down any convers any critical conversation uh, moving forward at that community meeting was shut down. Um, so I just wanted to point that out uh, and really uh, I think neighborhood board meetings, you know, despite being sparsely attended uh, are, in a, you know, a really good place for more than annual discussions about Red Hill, you know, um, to happen. And so if, if it would be really beneficial if kind of officials uh, were welcome, more welcome to criticism, I think. Thanks, Natanya. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, Ernie? Yes, Ernie. Yeah, sorry to ask so many questions. I, I'm just very, this is a very important topic for our community. Um, this is a question for the Department of Health and the US Navy and also the EPA. Uh, in the past, recently, there's been talk about giving the Navy not till 2037, but the 2045 to complete the work. And then uh, if not, uh, or remove the tanks after 2045, the year 2045, the fuel leak was in January of 2014. It's been now seven years uh, January of next year, it'll be seven years that we've been at this. Is the year 2045 or the extension of time to 2045 off the table and not gonna be put on the table at all? Uh, maybe a question for the Admiral and the Captain first. Gordon, you wanna respond first and then we'll let uh, the, the DOH and EPA uh, come in on this? Obviously, we will follow uh, the direction from the regulators. Uh, they are our partners and they are regulators and we will follow uh, what is outlined uh, by them. But as the AOC outlines, uh, best available practical uh, technical solutions are required by 2037. Uh, the Navy has gone further and committed to double wall containment by 2045. Uh, even if that is not a best available practical uh, solution at the time. And so that's a little bit of the difference between the, the two dates. Uh, so that, that means a facility will be continued to operate uh, uh, to 2045 
uh, you're extending your deadline to double all the tanks. That means you operate in the current mode till 2045. Yeah, I think uh, I don't want to confuse uh, BAPT and double wall containment. Um, we do not know if, if double wall containment will be a BAPT uh, at the year 2037. We'll obviously work with our, the regulators to determine what that BAP solution is at that time. Why don't you just explain what BAT means? There may be people who aren't familiar with that term. I'm just sorry, thank what... you. Yes, BAP, best available practical technology as we've discussed before. I'm sorry, I used that acronym. No, no, that's okay. We live in a world of acronyms. Yeah, so I, I'd like to add on the deadline um, issue. So I think one thing to point out is, you know, although the agencies haven't approved any, you know, complete upgrade package BAPT for this, for the, for the tanks um, and the leak detection, um, there have been a number of improvements since the release occurred. You know, I, I think we're all aware that the release occurred because of errors in a clean and spec repair process. And that repair process has been uh, significantly changed in order to eliminate the types of problems they saw back in uh, 2014 that caused that 27,000 gallon release. So although we haven't approved anything yet, um, it, it doesn't mean there hasn't been progress from 2014 to today. Um, but you know, we still, our AOC still has the all tanks must be upgraded by 2037 if they remain, if, if they continue to operate. And that has not changed at this point. The Navy's commitment, this 2045 commitment is for, for secondary containment is not necessarily at this point within, you know, part of the AOC. It's something beyond the AOC requirement at this point in time. Now, we may come up with the first BAP to secondary containment, and then that would need to be done by 2037. But if the first BAP does not include secondary containment for the tank vessels, then um, they would have to loop back around and, and, and re-upgrade those tanks if that, if that truly is their, their commitment. Yeah, I, thank you, Steve. I, uh, I just want to point out that the uh, current steel liner that keeps the fuel from leaking out is the quarter inch steel plate that was installed between 1940 and 1943. And it's, uh, it is corroding from the outside in inward. So uh, my concern still remains, you know, how long will that steel plate, how long will they be able to keep up with the patching approach and prevent releases. I think it's like a it's like a the boy that stuck his finger in the hole on the dam, and more holes developed after a while. Can you even practically practically keep up with that? Um, uh, so thank you. Uh, and so Department of Health uh, on the year 2045, our previous health director indicated that uh, he wanted the tanks up, and he was going to give them up to 2045 to complete that and because tanks should not be like this, of this size, and should not be located over a drinking water aquifer. Um, is it still the Department of Health's position? Or is 2045 still being discussed or considered in your rules or uh, in this discussion? Maybe this is a question for Roxanne or Key. Yeah, Ernie, uh, you know, as, as you well aware, uh, this topic has been in, in many different circles. We got a whole bunch of comments addressing that very uh, topic. And uh, the whole range of when should those tanks be in operation and taken out of operation is, is quite, uh, quite a range. Um, you know, we operate by laws and regulation and rules and the specific uh, topic that you're mentioning has been a, certainly a discussion uh, amongst our team and, and looking at the comments that we've got also. So uh, our previous director, Dr. Anderson, um, did give his uh, input into uh, uh, some draft rules that may be uh, uh, forwarded. Uh, right now, your guess is good as mine what the, the end date will be. 
but I'll let my staff kind of elaborate on that. Uh, so Lene, you want to address that? Okay. So uh, Ernie, if, as you recall, back in October 2019, um, DOH proposed the proposed uh, USD rule changes. And in part, there's two major components. One was to require all fuel constructed tanks, uh, underground tanks, I should say, and that are part of as well as those are part of the airport hydrant fuel distribution systems installed before July 15, 2018, to have secondary containment by July 15, 2045, removing the alternative for owners and operators to utilize an alternative design, which the director of health determines is protective of human health and environment. The other major portion of that rule change was to provide clarity to existing requirements and to ensure that the state regulations are fully consistent with federal regulations. As Keith mentioned, because we received a large volume of comments regarding to that first part of the rule change, um, as well as the, at the time there was a bill in legislature that would impact that portion, we chose to defer action on that and submitted a, an adopted version of the rules for that second part in February 2020 um, to the governor's office. Those portions of the rules are not yet effective. Regarding the proposal related, um, related to the fuel, fuel constructed tanks, DOH prepared a new set of rule pack, um, a new rule package and submitted it to the governor's office for consideration in September of 2020. Um, but unless those rules are changed, the current rules stand, and that is that fuel constructed tanks that were installed prior to 1998 and is required to be upgraded by July 15, 2038. This upgrade needs to be either the, to secondary containment or to an alternative design, which the Director of Health determines is protective of human health and environment. To date, we have not seen a proposal from the Navy for an alternative that meets this requirement. And absence of such alternative, we're expecting to not see the in individual tanks to be up to secondary containment or closed by July 15, 2038. Uh, thank you, Lene. Uh, just, uh, Peter, I'll just run through a few more questions if you don't mind. Is that okay? Then I'll, I'll be, be then I'll be done. I'll be pal. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, uh, there was mention about supplying uh, fuel to HECO, Hawaiian Electric. Uh, so I wanted to just get clarification from the Navy uh, if they have pipelines that can supply the uh, power plants at Waiau and Kahe uh, with fuel from the Red Hill fuel tanks, and also if they've uh, uh, completed or signed a formal agreement uh, that commits the Navy to provide fuel uh, to Hawaiian Electric during a disaster. So pipelines, are there pipelines that can supply the two power plants, one at Waiau and the other one at uh, Kahe? And then also, do they have a formal agreement with Hawaiian Electric? Captain Myers. Yes, so our fuel system uh, is tied into the, the commercial fuel system as well that was, is within the Honolulu uh, Pearl Harbor area. Uh, support to outlying areas could be done by fuel barge to support other areas. Uh, so you'd have to fill a barge of fuel with fuel, then how would you get that fuel to the Kahe power plant? And a Waiau power plant. Uh, so we, as we move the fuel fuel via a barge, it could be then re-put into the, the fuel system at those locations to then be put into to, uh, any fuel uh, uh, requirements for HECO in those areas. Oh, I think the, answer, the answer to your question was they do not have direct pipelines to those sites. Okay, and then the second was just do they have a have they signed an agreement with Horn Electric? We, we do not have a, we do not have a formal agreement uh, with HECO directly ourselves, but obviously we would work with FEMA uh, to support any natural uh, disasters, and I believe uh, uh, there are agreements there uh, through that effort that, that we could support. Are any other, okay. other uh, questions? Uh, yeah, really quickly. Uh, uh, I know there was a question about uh, uh, maybe from Natanya. I, I kind of forgot exact wording of her question about uh, uh, defects. Uh, 
are, are is the Navy concerned about any defects uh, in the welds? Uh, each tank is steel quarter inch steel plate that's welded together, and we kind of guess there might be like two miles of welds in each tank, each of the twenty tanks. Is, are there is that part of the maybe the defects or uh, structural problems or stresses? So as part of our clean and inspect repair process, we inspect every single weld. Uh, and every single uh, square inch of the, the material that is within the tank. And so, no, we are not concerned uh, about those welds because we, because of the detailed inspection and our process that we put in place to ensure their integrity. Uh, thank you. And can the Navy provide a copy of the uh, scope of work for the GTP North America uh, And that's a question that's uh, coming up. Project. Project. That's a yeah. question that's coming up. Uh, to, the, to the committee. Uh, so we can see what you're asking them to do. I mean, what you're asking them to do is, you know, I, it's kind of important, I think, that we uh, maybe you can make suggestions to you to include uh, some items in the scope of work that will make the uh, GTT uh, North America study really a uh, comprehensive study. Yes, we'll continue to work with the regulators to share any uh, appropriate documents uh, that, that might be uh, pertinent uh, as far as we move forward with this process. Uh, but I, I mentioned the committee, can you share with the committee? Uh... And, and you have to assume that if it's the committee, it's also public. Right, and so I would I would have to defer to the regulators. I don't want to overstate overstate or overstep my bounds with the regulators in answering that. Oh, okay, then let's uh, ask the uh, Department of Health and EPA. Department of Health and EPA, uh, Roxanne and uh, uh, Steve, would you be willing to share that with this committee no. and the public? Yeah, I've got to look. I don't think we have the document, and I think that. Uh, there's any confidential business information or any other confidential information in those in those documents uh, that parts those parts of the documents may need to be redacted by either the the vendor or the navy before they can be shared. Yeah, we're very used to blacked out or redacted portions of reports, but uh, the uh, would would you folks commit to uh, sharing with this committee? the redacted or blacked out version? Yeah, I mean, our, you know, what we've tried to do, EPA and DOH, is all documents related to Red Hill that come in uh, to us um, that are not confidential, we have been sharing those on our website. So I, I have to look and see if we have the scope of this, because this is kind of not, not a AOC deliverable. So I, I think we'll have to work with the Navy to see if we can get you know, documents people are looking for. And we'd be, as long as we've gotten versions that are considered by the Navy and their vendor uh, public information, we'll put them up on our website. Yeah, I appreciate it because this is the first time I've heard about this uh, this uh, feasibility study and uh, it actually is very encouraging. And uh, But it would be great if the, it was made available to the committee and the public. Uh, because uh, if this is helping to reduce the risks, it's important to, for us to know. Uh, la last question. Um, uh, and I, I just wanted to uh, kind of clarify, uh, uh, Steve, your position uh, earlier is that the, the rejection letter that came out just recently, October 26th or something uh, from you and Roxanne, uh, to the Navy on their TUA decision document. And, and uh, I think it also covered some, a few of the other submittals. Uh, but the bottom line for that, it, does, it doesn't rule out that if Navy provided you uh, information that would satisfy you that the clean inspect and repair process with some of uh, maybe an epoxy coating might still be on the table and uh, possibly approved. But we did not rule out any particular option. Okay. But what they presented to us was, I mean, it was not complete information. It did not have the rationale. So we couldn't make a decision based on, you know, how we read it. There were just, we had a number of questions. So that's, um, those deficiencies kind of outline the issues that we need the Navy to address in order to have a document, a submittal that we can 
that will be complete so we can make a decision. Okay, and maybe that's a question I can go back to Captain Myers. Uh, uh, is the Navy giving up on uh, the clean inspect and repair option given the DOH letter? And are you gonna be looking seriously like at the secondary containment option and come back with that recommendation in your TUA decision document? So obviously we plan to answer all the regulators questions and want to provide all the information that's possible. We, we are, I would say, not ruling out anything at this point. Uh, we continue to move forward with everything possible to ensure the integrity of the tanks. Okay, uh, uh, la last question and I am completely pow here. I, uh, I know we've advocated border water supply that the risk and vulnerability assessment be, be done on a quantitative, basically a numerical basis on analysis rather than a qualitative analysis of risk and vulnerability, which is kind of subjective opinions of experts. Uh, is the reverse risk and vulnerability assessment going to be done on a quantitative uh, analysis basis or is it gonna be done on a qualitative or opinion-based uh, analysis? Uh, yes, we, we don't have a revised scope to us yet, but um, you know, given the complexity at Red Hill and given that it's a, a unique facility, some aspects of the risk assessment are going to need, need to be based on kind of expert analysis that may not be um, statistically quantitative like what was attempted in the first phase of risk assessment. Uh, other aspects of the risk assessment will be, I mean, I, I'm predicting will be quantitative. So it's going to be kind of a combination approach this time. Um, it's, uh, yeah, given the, the unique and complex nature of the facility, um, it may be much more uh, uh, productive to focus on, uh, instead of trying to get quantitative probabilities that have a, a, a huge amount of potential error in them, identifying failure modes and, and really exploring what kind of mitigation measures can be taken to address those failure modes. So if those, are, if those failure modes are addressed, then we don't have to um, uh, explore these probabilities which are, again, like I said, very, very difficult to quantify. So an example, here's, here's, here's one example. We talked about before that there's infrastructure in the lower tunnel, like piping and, um, and, and nozzles and things like that. And they do, they move heavy equipment around in the lower tunnel. Um, could some, a piece of heavy equipment, an operator make a big error and, and, and crash a piece of heavy equipment into the pipeline that could cause a big release. Uh, I, I think our answer to that is, yeah, that potentially could happen. It may be fairly remote, but how do you quantify the likelihood that somebody's gonna make a big error like that and crash a piece of equipment into a pipeline? That's very difficult to do accurately. So what we're interested in, instead of spending you know, huge amounts of efforts and a long duration of time trying to quantify that, if something like that did happen, how would the Navy respond? What are their mitigation measures in, in the event of a big catastrophic failure in the lower tunnel? Uh, if you, you're talking about like an emergency response plan, I think I saw a document uh, that the Navy prepared uh, in the 2000s that talked about that type of scenarios. But uh, Steve, are, is the EPA and Department of Health gonna allow them? Uh, last year, they submitted a risk and vulnerability assessment report that was quantitative. And they, I think in there, they, I'm trying to use my memory, uh, mentioned about a pot, uh, there's probably probability of like a 2000 gallons a, a day being leaked out of a facility uh, out of the 20 tanks or so. And there's a possibility of up, maybe up to a 200,000 gallon release. And that was a quantitative uh, vulner, risk and vulnerability assessment. Uh, shortly after it was submitted to you folks, the Navy made a request to, uh, they seem to try to pull that back. 
are you going to allow them to pull that analysis back or is that analysis submitted and it's going to be considered in the decisions on risk and vulnerability going forward? Yeah. Um, we, you know, we have been considering that document. It's not getting pulled back. I think that um, there is uncertainty in terms of the numbers that were generated through these statistical methods. And a lot of that is because the facility is, is unique and they had very little data to use to try to um, predict various different types of failures. So, you know, I think the most valuable part of that, that study was some of the um, bigger picture conclusions and recommendations in terms of, of, of changes. So one example was um, there appeared to be a higher degree of risk for the smaller nozzle that comes out of the tank because it can't be inspected the same way as the larger nozzle. And um, the recommendation of that study was the smaller nozzle was somewhat redundant and could be eliminated from tanks by reducing risk. And the Navy has used that. And my understanding, and uh, Captain Myers, you may want to uh, you know, uh, clarify this, but my understanding is you're moving forward and uh, decommissioning the smaller nozzles. Yes, sir, I'll, I'll address that. And so, yes, uh, yes, we are moving forward with removing those smaller nozzles that uh, that could potentially have have a higher risk. And, and similar to what uh, uh, Natanya's uh, question was and, and my description of, of removing are uh, put, uh, putting out of commission those nozzles. And we did have done that with tank five and we'll be do that as we continue our clean inspect repair process as we take tanks offline and uh, improve them in that process. Um, Melanie, I think you had a question and I wanna move us to a public discussion very shortly. So uh, right to the point, if you will. Yeah, I'll get I'll ask a few of them real quickly. So back to the fuel needs assessment study, does the Navy even have it done? That's first question. Okay. Yes, yeah, so uh, it is not a Navy study, it is an Indo-PACOM Department of Defense study uh, that okay. has uh, just been completed and uh, being reviewed right now. So though it was promised in December of 2018, it took this much longer. Um, I, I, it was just completed. Um, I know there's some complexity in uh, determining the need of, of uh, such a large uh, complex uh, uh, determination. And yes, the Indo-PACOM just recently uh, released that study. And now who, goes, who actually receives the study and the information? So that'll be used within the Department of Defense to determine what our needs are and where we need to uh, uh, align our resources to ensure uh, fuel is in, in the right quantities at the right locations and uh, to ensure that uh, we maintain our national security. And so would that be shared with the Armed Forces Committee uh, in both the House and Senate, which I think both of our representatives are part of? Obviously, uh, Navy and Department of Defense will respond uh, to uh, any congressional uh, requirements that, that are mandated. So they would have to ask for it. You're not going to just report it to them. You know, I, I can't uh, state that. So I'm uh, here, you know, I'm a, I'm a Navy expert right. uh, on Red Hill, but I can't talk necessarily to the specifics of how uh, that report will, will be disseminated. I have a question about the building of the tanks. I mean, it was done quickly. It was in secret. It was during war, everything, you know, I, I get it. Did the Navy know that the aquifer was that close to the tanks? at the time in the 1940s? I can't uh, say for certain uh, that they knew that, but I, I um, am confident uh, that, uh, actually, let me re rephrase that. From documents that I have read, it is my understanding that uh, the people who constructed the tanks knew that there was an aquifer there and used that knowledge and how they constructed the tanks to, to ensure their security at the time. Obviously, I wasn't there personally, so I can't say uh, exactly what was done, but that's the documentation I have read and, and understand they, it, they were aware of it. 
Yeah. So the other, sorry, the other comment I have is that nozzles are nozzles are not the tank. I really appreciate that the nozzles have been changed and repaired, um, but they're not the tank. So I get Ernie's concern as well. Um, the tanks are huge, so it covers a lot of area. They have one last point I have is that um, we keep changing the term BAPT to from practicable to practical. And practicable means what you can put into practice. And we are able to put into practice above ground tanks now. And to make the public feel better, I think moving forward on that, moving forward on something above ground may actually be useful. And no, I'm not saying one tank at a time, maybe five tanks. You, you're gonna need to put it out to bid for five tanks per, per, contract, per contractor, it might be a good idea. Um, but this is what's able to be done now. It is practicable. Um, practical is something else. It does have a monetary significance to it. I get that as well. But to reassure the public, I think that might be something you might want to look into again. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. I'd like to, unless we have any other burning comments or questions, which I'll ask you to keep brief, I'd like to transition over to the public uh, discussion. Is there any objections from the committee? All right, let's do that. So uh, thank you public for being very patient with this. It's a long conversation, but I hope some of your questions uh, were answered and I hope you got some information that may be useful. It may just be leading to more questions, which is always the case. Let me preface this session uh, with a couple of things. One is, we received uh, two, two Perry from Department of Health uh, made available advanced questions and comments to bring in. And there were 22, 23 people that I think responded. And uh, I wanna just summarize it. I was asked to kind of, could I summarize some of it? Now all this will get posted. So you're not, you know, this is, I'm, if I'm translating things not right or through my own filters that are wrong, you'll, you'll see the originals and I'll stand corrected. I heard from 23 people when I read through the comments and I'm gonna tell you who responded. David, and I, uh, please forgive me if I mangle your names. David Kaiser, Harvey, Har Harvey Arkin, Patrick Rays, Arlene Velasco, Jennifer Valentine, uh, Kate Payne, Valerie Weiss, Kim Jorgensen, Denise Bolsford, Sherry Pollock for Hawaii 350, Helen Nakano, uh, Penelope Hazard, Julia Ishado, Colonel Ann Wright, uh, Shannon Rand Rudolph, sorry, Patricia Blair, Ashley Nishihara, and Linda Ish Nishihara, uh, Kai Chu, uh, Melody Ajura, I'm sorry if I'm mangling your name, uh, Aduja, um, David Ford, Lois Berger, and Alfred Torres. And I went through these last night and I'm gonna to try to summarize a little bit of what came through to me, if you don't mind and bear with me, which won't take long and then we'll open it up again for questions first and then uh, uh, comments. So 23 comments submitted and they were really in three different categories as I sorted through it. One was comments on the Navy's work and the Navy's efforts. Second one was on preferred solutions. And the third one was on regulators, to, about the regulators. So on the Navy's efforts, some people said the Red Hill tanks were an amazing accomplishment and part of the World War II heritage, but are old and must now be made safe. One way or another, bottom line, it has to be made safe and not endanger the aquifer. Um, and they, well, concurrent with that was comments that said the Navy's current plans are inadequate. Uh, Navy's preferred alternative to do epoxy coatings and new water treatment plant are not the best alternative. That may be older uh, news. And the 2038 deadline extension uh, is to 2045 is much too long. Those were the comments about the Navy. There were preferred solutions that came out in many of the comments. One was stop trying to do this on the cheap. We know that dollars are important. On the other hand, this is a safety issue. Empty the tanks and shut the facility down relocate the tanks to another safer location and double wall all the tanks. Those are the comments that were coming through, some of which we've talked about with the committee. And then there were some comments that uh, came through on the regulators. One of those is uh, a, a sense that the DOH is not doing an adequate job of monitoring, regulating, and performing its oversight. Uh, there was some comments that said uh, about concurring with the DOH and EPA's rejection letter. This is the latest uh, piece. 
And then there was, uh, and people wanted a guarantee of immediate notification of any future releases. So that's what came through. Now that's mine. It will all be posted to uh, the, the site and two can talk about that a little later on. So the floor is open. Uh, can I ask, uh, when you ask a question, you can use the chat and we have a couple of questions in there, I think. So I'm gonna start with those. And the one was, uh, let's see, this is from Jody uh, Malinowski from the Sierra Club. Will the Navy incorporate this new double wall commitment into the AOC deadline of 2037 or the administrative rules deadline for 2038? Or are they still aiming for around 2045? as proposed under the September 2019 SUA decision. So that's a question I think that uh, goes right back to Captain Gordy. Yes, thanks. And so uh, I think we're, our, as, we, as I've talked about, we're still in the very early stages of the feasibility assessment of uh, this potential double wall solution. Um, you know, we're not, can't commit that this will be a uh, best available practice that we can implement uh, in the AOC schedule. And so, uh, I don't want to commit, uh, given the, the early stages we are in this feasibility assessment. Another question from Sierra Club was, after initially rejecting the 2019 destructive testing report, what improvements will be made on the corrosion and metal fatigue testing process to improve accuracy of corrosion predictions? How will the Navy prevent corrosion on the outside of the tanks? Comments, Captain? Yeah, so we are still uh, uh, working to improve that statement of work. But also, if you look at uh, what we've talked about, the University of Hawaii and some of the initiatives there to inspect uh, the tanks. And uh, we continue to look at ways to best uh, ensure uh, we monitor and uh, uh, look at any corrosion that may be occurring. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came up earlier in the chat line was whether all this, uh, this video recording will be available. And uh, I just wanna say what my understanding is um, that um, it, it will be posted, the audio cast and the video cast will be posted, but they also have pending technical file size. Some of you may know that Zoom, Zoom video recordings can occupy a huge amount of bandwidth. So they will try to do that, but there will be a site and I can bring that up a little later again, where everything goes to that site based on this meeting. So. The idea is not to lose any information and lose anything. I think people will make their best effort to make the whole recording available uh, pending uh, file size. So I think those are the questions that came in. Um, are there other questions for clarification and comment? We're taking those first. So the floor is open. And please identify yourself when you have a question. Part of this is getting you know, information exchanged and questions answered to the best of everybody's ability. Aloha, I have a question. Go ahead, Melody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, yes. Again, my name is Melody Aduha. I am the vice chair of the Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. I apologize for mangling your name. <laughs> That's okay. I recall meeting you a couple years ago, and uh, I had invited you to go and see what appeared to be uh, a bunker fuel on the ground close to the quarantine. We weren't able to have that meeting, however, and I still invite you again next time you are in Hawaii, assuming you are not. But right mm -hmm. now, but anyway, that's another story. Go ahead okay. with your question. Okay, My question is, and it's something that doesn't appear to have been addressed anywhere, is that in close proximity to the tank farm is that quarry. And that quarry mm -hmm. continuously mines and excavates soil, which causes movement mm -hmm. to the earth. So mm -hmm. given that, should that not also be a consideration? Because every time there is whatever they do to dig up the earth, that's going to make that movement, which could cause or could could make the tanks more vulnerable to, or the, the petroleum vulnerable to escape. Okay, let me turn over to uh, both Captain Myers and well as Steve and Roxanne or anybody from DOH, because I think it's a bigger question than just the Navy's. But comments? Thank you. Well, I can, I'll say something to that. I, you know, the quarry area, is interesting. It makes kind of the groundwater movement around the area somewhat 
complex because there's water getting in and it's uh, and there's limitations in terms of putting wells there. Uh, from what I've seen, I don't see that quarry area. It's far enough away from the tanks. And I don't think it's undermining structurally the geology where the tanks are. So I don't think that's a concern at all. Um, I, Captain Myers may want to elaborate on that. But um, you know, the, you know, the quarry has been there for a long time. And uh, it is a feature that we've you know, has been part of our investigation of the groundwater in the area. Comments? And uh, I will uh, uh, say that we concur with Mr. Lindner uh, on uh, uh, the the, uh, the distance from uh, that quarry and the impact it would have to our tanks. The tanks, while we've talked about the age that they are, uh, were built very well, and they are locked into that hillside, and we believe provide very little risk. Uh, to uh, to any release related to uh, any activity that's happening at uh, at the quarry. You know, I, I look at Mr. Linder, I see the, the Golden Gate Bridge behind him. You know, that that was built about the same time as as the tanks at Red Hill, and uh, it continues to to go strong uh, through continuous improvement and maintenance, just as we are doing at, at our Red Hill tanks to ensure their their longevity. So tests have been made then has studies have been made then regarding the effects of the quarry on the tanks. To, to that specific answer uh, question. No, they have not. We have not seen any any need or correlation that would cause a, a risk to the facility. Okay, although earthquake is definitely a risk that it's always in everyone's consideration because one earthquake then that would cause a catastrophic occurrence to those tanks, would you not figure that perhaps work on the quarry might also cause that earth shifting that may be at risk to the tanks? You said you have, but you've not studied it. That's my question. It needs to me, it should be studied. So obviously uh, earthquake is a concern in Hawaii, but I'll say the, you know, the EPA level of earthquake risk in, in Honolulu is not great. And given how the tanks are constructed and locked within the, the mountain and would move within the mountain, we don't see that risk. I'll tell you that was something that came up early on when we EPA got involved. And um, we did have uh, some engineers do a very, I'd say, brief look at is this a concern? And we did talk to the USGS on the Big Island, you know, the earthquake experts out there. And um, although, it, you know, there's possibility of an earthquake um, occurring that could cause some problems, we don't see uh, at this point, um, it does not appear that there's, you know, there would be like a major differential earth movement at Red Hill, unless there was a really large earthquake. And that is something that is going to be kind of uh, a focus of this next phase of risk assessment. Other questions, other questions, clarifications. That was helpful, Melody. Thank you about earthquakes. How about others? Hello. Huh? David Ford, can anybody hear me there? Yes, we can hear you. you okay. Have video, you have video uh, capability? Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm well, not that good at this yet. My <laughs> second time around. <laughs> Practicing Zoom. Um, so, um, what does that have to say is pretty peculiar. Um, I went to a company called Steel Tech a while back. Uh, this is when they had the meeting at uh, Mauna Loa uh, Elementary. And about a week later, I went to Steel Tech, and the owners there told me that the building, and it looked like a bomb shelter because it was 10 inch concrete stand up building, you, it shook like a hawk of cards every time the quarry shot a blast. And so I hadn't gone back there, but a couple of weeks ago, and the building has a lot of large cracks in it that weren't there prior to the last visit that I had. And they've been blasting there, Henry J. Kaiser, now Hawaiian Cement for years. And I, I, my, my thinking is those tanks, as strong as they are, because MK made the Hoover Dam, and oh my God. So those tanks, but it, in their age, you'd probably give them a little bit of a buzz that they don't need. So does the Navy 
you know, want to use some type of 3M chemical to saturate the tank four foot concrete in the area to permeate them so they can't leak? And then do they know that JP8 love uh, to eat stainless steel like nobody's business? So Marisco, Fred Andwadi, right here in our own shipyards here at Campbell Park, he has a cure and he's been curing some Navy vessels of their uh, tank leaks of the stainless steel nature for jet fuels because the tank farm was originally used for heavy fuels and not and not things like JP8, um, but they are now. And, and I think that the Navy's got a beautiful hot rod there, you know, and it needs a good, uh, you know, pull the head, shave the heads and, you know, pour the cylinders and put a new blower on it. Um, it, it needs a, it needs a lot of, of, of modern work. The piping, it, it should be made uh, to be able to valve over in case there's a cracked pipe right in the middle of fuel, fueling something in a high, uh, uh, what do you call it, national security need to fuel ships, mid-pack, ring pack, whoever. Uh, at a moment's notice and be able to do those other things he was talking about. But you have 30 seconds left in your comment, please. Okay, and and the pumps are too old, I think. They need something really bad, you know, like that's really badass, you know, and get right with the program and a double, triple electric system. So if there's a failure, then if the unthinkable happens and there's some kind of explosion and fire, that the smoke is choked with some kind of uh, nitrogen and not the type of stuff they got. Now I call the fire chief and he says that won't work. And I don't think there's a state or a federal fire boat capacity to do much in case any of that got into the water. David, thank so you. those are the things they might want to look at. Thank you for your uh, comment. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. How about others, comments or questions that you still want to get answered for? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, my name's uh, Dave Monix with uh, Our Revolution Hawaii. And um, I know that the military, I mean, I've watched them um, uh, in their hearings, and they will spend unlimited amount of money on any kind of weapon system that they want without hesitation. If there's a billion dollar plane, they will order them. Yet they're skimping and, and trying to save every penny on uh, Red Hill. And that is absurd. So that, that is my first comment that the Navy should be putting in as much money as they're willing to spend on a weapon system to protect the health and safety of our community. Um, um, sorry, <laughs> I got excited there. But uh, yeah. the other thing is that, that um, you know, he, they're talking about strategically, this is important to the military. Well, it could be strategically important to have a nuclear weapon in the middle of downtown Honolulu, but would you risk the lives of the people making it a target for the enemy just because, well, it's strategically advantageous. And the, the fuel tanks at Red Hill are just that. Korea's talking about getting nuclear weapons and shooting them, and they could shoot it to, to Honolulu. And those fuel tanks are a target. And uh, it puts all of us in jeopardy. So um, if you're talking about strategic, strategic is supposed to be protecting the people of the United States, not the weapon systems themselves. We are the first priority. And you can always move weapon systems. You can always change things around. But we, the people, and that's totally out of your comments that you've been making on how important this is strategically. How are you protecting us? Thank you. Thanks, David. Other comments or questions? Yes. Hello? Yes, go ahead, please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Kyle Kajihiro. Um, I was Hi. trying to ask a question in the chat. I think you might've missed it. Um, I've been trying to find out information about the GTT North America uh, contract uh, with the Defense Innovation Unit. And I can't find a contract number or any of the information usually available uh, publicly. So I'm wondering if you can make that information available. Um, I'd like to do a, a FOIA request on that, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. I think we talked about it, but why don't we repeat that again? So exactly what the status is of the GTT uh, feasibility study and the contract. Could you go back, um, Captain Myers? Yeah, so uh, we talk about a contract. So this was through Defense Innovation Unit, which has a unique uh, contracting ability. And so uh, it was through another 
transaction authority uh, on this, how this was done uh, rather quickly and in uh, a unique way to make sure we get the right technology. And so uh, we've put some press releases out on that. Oh, we can uh, ensure that those get uh, disseminated. So as much information as uh, we can get passed on that. Well, the, the thing that um, I've, I've seen a number of articles um, published, but they're kind of limited in the, the amount of information that's available. Usually a contract announcement would have, you know, solicitation numbers, contract award numbers, a dollar amounts. Uh, it, it would spell out the scope of the, of the project and the deliverables and timelines. So I'd like to get more of those kind of details and I don't see any of that available publicly. And if you can uh, help us with posting that. Okay, any other comments on that, Captain? Or from uh, the regulators? We, I think different people would like to hear more about that contract and what's in it and what are the details of it. So you're asking a question that's, uh, you know, others are, it's on other people's minds as well. Yeah. We as the regulators also don't have a copy of that contract, but if we can get something from the Navy and my under, my, my guess is probably parts of it will be have to be redacted because of confidential business information, but we'll see what we can get. And if we do get that, we will put it up on our website and then we'll notify the, the Red Hill mailing list. Okay, thank you. Thanks, other comments, other questions? The floor is still open. Don't be shy. This is your moment. Um, we'll stay open to more, but I want to go through the further parts of the agenda, and then we'll see if there's any further comments to be done. Um, to Perry, do you want to say anything, and Keith, about the next meeting and the plans for future meetings? I think uh, we'll just go to that and then if I'll come back one more time see if there's any last questions and comments. Okay, thanks Peter. Um, this is to Perry. Um, um, as you recall at the end of every meeting, uh, we do ask the committee members if they're satisfied with the annual frequency and um, we haven't actually heard otherwise. Of course now with all the COVID stuff and um, I feel like the deliverables and stuff with the ALC has been increasing. So we, we also thought about maybe doing a newsletter. Uh, of course, there were bills that were introduced that wanted to increase the frequency of the task force as well. So those are all on the table um, for committee members to talk about. Committee members, do you have a thought on the frequency of meetings? They've been once a year, yes. Ernie. Uh, you know, we did support a bill to have at least two meetings. I, I think a more, but if we can do more meetings of this committee without having to pass a law, that would be great. Uh, because I think it's actually a great opportunity for the community, the public to learn more about what's happening at Red Hill. Like the information that came out today, I thought was very uh, informative and be able to ask questions and express opinions. So I would advocate for a minimum two, maybe three meetings a year, or even better yet, maybe quarterly uh, would be good. Other comments from committee members? What's Ernie, your- do you have a preference um, that it would be remote? Would that be okay or? Uh, I, I think right now, you know, that we're in a new normal. Uh, remote works for me because we, we're doing that business already. Uh, but once the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the vaccines widely distributed them in person, it would be great. Or I, I kind of foresee for Board of Water Supply, it'll probably be a hybrid. It'll probably be in person and also remote to allow greater pu public participation and transparency. Good. Well, we know we're probably still months away from vaccines and full therapeutics that have been distributed across the population. So you should assume that uh, any near-term meetings will probably have to be on Zoom, which we know is complex and a bit awkward. Other comments from committee members, preferences or public? This is Melanie. I would prefer quarterly because it will probably be bargained down to semi-annually. <laughs> so um, that would be my preference to say quarterly as well. And I, I agree with Ernie that this gives the public an opportunity to 
chime in. And the Moana Lua meeting was also a good one. Um, I hope that continues. Good. Any other committee members, preferences? Okay. Well, this is Kaleo, sorry. I, I would support quarterly as well um, as a co-trustee of water, support DOH and trying to meet regularly to understand the issues at hand. So um, just kind of support Ernie and, and Melanie's approach. And and uh, via Zoom is perfectly fine. Thanks, Kaleo. Okay, we will, I reckon if you have other uh, thoughts on this, you can forward those on to Keith, uh, who's chair. And, uh, you know, there'll be some kind of decision making around that that will come forward. Um, I want to see if there, I don't want to belabor all this. I want to see if there's any last comments or questions, either from the committee or from the public. And I'm going to turn to Ernie first, because you always have a question. Ernie, I love your questions, though. You're, you're, you're asking good questions. Well, thank you, Peter. But I, I think I've uh, exhausted my checking account on allowable questions. Here, so I appreciate all your hard work and uh, no and the Department of Health uh, for putting this on. Oh, Very good. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, hi. Sure. Oh, sorry. Dave Monix here. Um, Ernie, thank you. With, without you, our water would not be protected. We we the whole community is just grateful to you. And Melanie, thank you too. Uh, I can see your two advocates protecting us, and we really appreciate it. Well, hello, Dave. Hi. Could I say something? Yes. My name is Wendell Chong, and I've attended a lot of meetings. And I appreciate you folks having the public uh, get some input. However, at the last meeting, uh, it was brought up that I think the captain has said that the water, the, field, the water tanks are tight. And an engineer had stood, stood up and said that tight means we're, that tightness doesn't mean they're, they're not leaking. It means there's good intolerance, which means there is leaking of the tanks. And she mentioned that several thousand gallons per year can be leaking. From I know you're breaking up. Your, your sound is breaking okay. up. I don't know. Oh, but anyway, I wonder uh, why are we kicking the can down the road, taking so long to make the decisions? Uh, you know, the Navy knows they spend a lot of money. We spend money on things like that ball in in, in the in the Pearl Harbor, which doesn't work. So systems too. But you know what I don't understand is why are we you know taking our time and not just doing what needs to be done. You know, it doesn't seem as though the Navy does seem, the, the Navy doesn't seem to care about the people of Hawaii. They just care about the Navy. Is anybody in the Navy gonna take personal responsibility if there is a leak and there is a leak? You're, you're, That's you're what I gotta say. Up, so it's hard. I think we got the idea what you were trying to say which was why does it take so long? And uh, some of that has been responded to. Uh, I'm sure it's taking longer for than everybody wants. Uh, and we've talked about several different deadlines that are coming up, but I'm not a spokesman for the Navy or an apologist or any, for anybody. So um, thank you for your comment, Wendell. And the question of how long all this takes continues. It's yeah. still on there. Anybody else? Yeah, we, uh, there's a sense of urgency that we need to take it. Again. How does it work? Let's push it I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch your... Well, I'm sorry, I missed the last comment you made, Wendell. Some, someone muted me. But anyway, it's just that why can't we, what I'm, what I need, what I'm really interested in saying is we need to work with a sense of urgency in this matter. It's not something that we just let go. It's very important. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And that's come through on quite a few of the comments that I saw earlier on and what I've heard too. Okay, other comments from anybody? Otherwise, we will bring this to a close. I'll turn it back over. Thank you, dear. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me again? Okay, so uh, I'm wondering if the commander of the Navy, are they aware of mass electroforming to help them with their leaks? That's a, a old technology made new and most of that information is on the Chinese web these days. Uh, that's all my comment. 
Hey, Peter, this is to Perry again. Um, before we adjourn, I just wanted to remind everybody that they can still submit comments to me via my email, which is to thu.perry at doh.hawaii.gov um, up until November 25th. And whatever you send me, I'll incorporate into the report to the ledge at the end. Um, also on our homepage, you can subscribe your email, register that to get updates. Um, so just Google Department of Health Hawaii UST and you should get you there. Or you can email me. Thanks to I'm gonna turn it back over to Keith for final comments or benedictions. Um, I'd like to say something. Yes, who's speaking? Hello. Yes, Hi, who's my name is Lana Brosiak, and I've been to all your meetings. And um, I just want to say that um, I've worked on quite a few uh, cleanup sites, including uh, the Mass Military Reservation. And, um, you know, when we had public meetings, um, we were had access to the engineers and the contractors. And um, I, I worked for AFSI, and we, we made such an effort to put out these comprehensive technical presentations to the public. And I don't feel like we get that. We get a meeting once a year and we get a 20 minute synopsis with 10 bullets on one slide. And I think that the meeting that we had that you folks hosted at the elementary school with the poster sessions that allowed us direct contact with the contractors and you had graphics and we could stand there and really spend some time asking questions. So if you're gonna bump up the committee meetings to an annual base or to a quarterly basis, I would appreciate if we had an annual poster session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I think that would help me as well, that kind of more in-depth um, explanation because so much of this went over my head. <laughs> Just thought like, how can I contribute meaningfully if I don't really understand, you know, what half of these terms mean? So I think, um, Obviously, we're limited, you know, being virtual, but uh, what the last commenter said really resonates with me as well. Thanks, Natanya. Peter, I have a comment. Yes, go ahead, Jody. Hi, this is Jody with the Sierra Club. I just wanted to be on the record um, extending a mahalo to the Department of Health and EPA for their uh, letter that they released this week. It was a pleasant surprise and kind of started to feel like they were starting to address some of the community comments that we've been saying year after year. Um, obviously, there are still room for improvement as we move forward with these meetings, um, but wanted to make sure that I extended that thank you um, as we go forward and, and make progress on Red Hill. Um, it is hard to feel heard when we have, you know, new commanders of the Navy coming in every couple of years. So that continuity is very important for the community to build that trust. Um, so I appreciate even in this meeting, this has been the first time that we've had this kind of Q&A session with the public. Normally it's me just providing comments and I think that that's been really helpful. Um, so I like this facilitated uh, approach and um, just wanted to extend thank you for, for being open to doing something uh, new and different on this. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. Last comments? Keith. Thank you, Jody, for that comment. Um, and certainly I wanna thank all the committee members uh, for your participation uh, in this and your interests. Um, and also to the public, um, not just on this uh, Zoom call, but um, everywhere. Uh, I think it's been a good, good discussion given this is our first effort to do it virtually. And I think because of the current situation, we're probably dealing with that um, you know, at least in the near future. I know many of you are participating in various Zoom calls, team calls, and, and what have you. So given the situation, I think it, it went rather well. Uh, I will take those comments um, and, and provide those feedbacks. And we'll also look at the, uh, the meeting frequency. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, the Navy is also required to provide more in-depth those meetings. I mean, I think I tell you the question you ask about getting more detailed information. That's <clears throat> we've tried different formats, but that's the kind of detailed information that you can actually talk one on one with a subject matter expert or an engineer um, or a regulator and, and get those kind of questions answered. Um, it's difficult to do it in this kind of forum, um, even though we try to <clears throat> give the status of the various, you know, uh, 
projects going on within the AOC and outside the AOC. So we'll, we'll take those uh, recommendations to under advisement and, and we'll, we'll provide that feedback back to you. But again, thank you for every, your participation and uh, to everybody on the line, stay safe. And that's from the director of health. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close the meeting up. Thank you, everybody, for coming and uh, be safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. Thank you. Aloha. Mahalo. Mahalo. That was wonderful. Okay. So, are we done here? Yeah. So, what do we do now? Okay. Does it?